We'll now call this workshop meeting of the Jacksonville City Council to order. Um, we have a copy of the proposed agenda at your places, and I would entertain a motion at this time to adopt. So moved. Second. We'll a motion and a second. Discussion on this item. Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed. Next, we have adoption of minutes and consent items, and there's a bunch of consent items on there. Um, I would uh, entertain a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. That's both the minutes and the consent items. Yes, sir. Okay. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? <clears throat> Actually, there was only one. That's right. <laughs> 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 Our first workshop uh, item tonight, we have uh, Captain Tim uh from the uh, Medi uh, Naval Medical uh, Center and 
you're going to give us a little update. And Richard, I'll let you lead us into this, please. Certainly our pleasure and honor this evening to have a captain and also uh, Command Master Chief Michelle Brooks from the Naval Hospital. We know that this is an important component of our community as we have 55,000 personnel who are stationed here. The hospital plays an extremely important role. Several weeks ago, I had the opportunity to work with my liaison with the hospital, and that's the handsome Marty Somerville back over there. <laughs> so Marty, uh, thanks for setting this up. But it is indeed our privilege to, to have both of you with us tonight. I know that you've had the opportunity to see the captain's bio, but there are a couple of points I think that the public uh, would be interested in. In previous tours, he was with 2F, he was with 2MEF in Afghanistan. He has been the force surgeon, and he's the deputy CO for Tripler Army Medical Center in Hawaii. He also states that in Hawaii, it never gets as cold as it did here in Jacksonville last week, but that's just an aside. Uh, it is indeed our privilege to have you with us this evening, sir, and also, Commander, with you. And at this time, we'd like for you to give us an overview of activities and information you'd like to share with the Mayor and Council. Okay, thank you so much for the, uh, the kind uh, introduction. Uh, Mayor, how are you today? Uh, council members, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to present this. Uh, to you with uh, Command Master Chief uh, Brooks, and already introduced is uh, Marty Somerville over here, as, uh, who's our lead on this particular project, and you all know and love uh, Riley Eversall, who has been just wonderful for us uh, in our efforts to stay in touch with the community. Uh, I'd like to take about 10 minutes, maybe, uh, to discuss the transition that the Naval Medical Center is uh, having right now to uh, leadership from out from under the Bureau of Medicine uh, to being under the Defense Health Agency. As you can see in the, uh, the purpose is just that the Defense Health Agency under the uh, National Defense Authorization, Authorization Act of 2017 uh, was granted the authority to take uh, to assume control of all the military treatment facilities uh, under the military health system and as such uh, has worked through uh, with the Congress and with the Department of Defense a transition plan uh, for which we are in the phase two part of effective 1 October 2019. Uh, there are hospitals that were within the first phase and even if you want the uh, introductory phase, Bethesda, Belvoir, National Capital Area Clinics uh, all fell under the DHA starting about 2014, uh, have been under their supervision for that time. Uh, in October of this year, our budget came under control of the Defense Health Agency, and some of the representative commands uh, in the East Coast uh, came under DHA control as well. Fort Bragg, the Womack Army Medical Center, uh, became a DHA oversight. And for the Navy, Navy Hospital Jacksonville, Florida, came under their control earlier this year. We're under phase two of that transition. And actually, just this week, we have we are hosting the Navy Medicine East and the Navy Bureau of Medicine and Surgery team uh, that is helping us through the initial stages of the transition documents. Uh, that are uh, required in, in order to uh, conduct this change. If you look at some of the catalysts for these changes, if you look, uh, National Defense Authorization Act 2017 was the one that actually enacted the DHA oversight and then refined in 2018 and 19. Uh, DOD healthcare reform uh, has also been a process that really has been underway since about 1946. Uh, there have been 14 studies looking at the defense uh, military or the military health system uh, over those years. 13 of those studies said that uh, the, the military health system should fall under a single unified command, and 13 times that was felt to be too hard by the, uh, the Department of Defense. The 14th study happened in about 2011-2012 time period, and on the 14th try, they got it right, and we're, we're doing the transition. So that was kind of a push. And with that, the anticipation over probably the next five to 10 years is you will see a reduction in the total number 
or in the scope of care that's happening under uh, the direct care health system, and more of that be now either clinics where places are not busy enough to support a full military hospital or converting to, as we have, a, mil a naval medical center where we actually have some enhanced capabilities such as our trauma program. If you look at the uh, Chief of Naval Operations focus uh, from a warfighter perspective, he is looking at increasing warfighter lethality, particularly within the Marine Corps and the fleet forces. And then the way that the medical folks support that uh, is as refocusing the medical forces to better support them in making them ready to be a ready medical, or I'm sorry, a medically ready force to go forward, whereas we as a medical platform will be a ready medical force with all of the skills and attributes that we need to be able to go forward and be able to do good things. If you look at the military treatment facilities, they're really not supportable as a readiness mission platform. Uh, at Camp Lejeune, we're very fortunate to have adopted the trauma program, and with that, there is a lot of good day-to-day uh, -day management of very complicated traumatic injuries that simulate some of the things that we see downrange. But even in with, with that level three trauma center and, and having three to five traumas per day that come through our emergency department, even that pales in comparison to what we do when we're downrange and faced with wartime uh, injuries. So again, uh, though they represent a good platform for us to be able to practice our skills and whatnot, they're probably not sufficient to completely uh, make us ready for our wartime mission. Uh, I'll let you read on your own the Naval Medical Center at Camp Lejeune uh, mission statement. Uh, but as directed by the Defense Health Agency, uh, the hospital will be classified as a Navy Medicine Readiness Training Command uh, with its subordinate units, all our branch clinics and whatnot, uh, coming 1 October of this year. On this slide, uh, illustrating the relationship of Navy Medicine Readiness Training Command to our operational units and our operational medical platforms. Operational uh, units are, for us, largely the Marine Corps, uh, TUMF being the largest one. We also provide a lot of support for the Installations Command. We uh, provide a lot of support for the Coast Guard that has a special mission training group on base that we support them as well. So again, our capabilities in supporting them and uh, enhancing their ability to work on the lethality part or their mission capability, the big part for us pushing to them is that medically ready force, making them more ready physically and prepared to go forward. On the right-hand side, you see the operational medical platforms. Uh, that would be, though I'm working at the hospital, my actual operational platform would be the 2nd Medical Battalion. And with the 2nd Medical Battalion, if they were to deploy tonight to go to war and support that, then we need to be a medically or a ready medical force to be able to support those capabilities. And we need to be able to go back and forth between operational units and the MTF and be effective in either, either part of that. How do we do that? Uh, well, we'll have some of our work will be at the MTFs with primary care, surgical services, women's health, those sort of things. Some of that will be in non-MTF where we'll be actually pushing out. We already have pushed out into the gyms, the barracks, the exchanges to make access more uh, readily available uh, to our, our patients and our warfighters. And then also through our partnerships with our civilian partners. And again, that's where from city council's perspective, that's really where the meat of this uh, discussion is really important to y'all. Because again, within the community, we already have existing relationships, but I think this transition will offer uh, quite a bit more opportunity for some of those training partnerships and healthcare partnerships uh, than what we have at the present time. I'm the lucky man that gets to split himself in two, uh, where, as right now, I'm the commanding officer of the Naval Medical Center at Camp Lejeune, single hat commanding officer, Title 10 authorities, responsibilities for the healthcare benefit, operation of the hospital, and all that. I get to split into two, or at least uh, the number of people I get to 
be led by splits into two. And on the left-hand side will be the Defense Health Agency, where we will be managing the hospital, if you will, or managing the health care benefit. Uh, and with that, I'll have administrative controls over the hospital, much like I do right now in terms of credentialing and oversight and providing services and, and whatnot. Goals of that, lower costs, better health care. On the right-hand side come my Title X authorities. Defense Health Agency is just that. It's an agency. No Title X authorities with that. So you cannot do uh, non-judicial punishment. You can't do any of those command and control things because, again, you are not a commander on the left-hand side of the screen. On the right-hand side of the screen is the Surgeon General's equities of command, control, uh, man, train, equip, organize uh, the force medically. And so that ensures that our forces are ready medically, so that's the operational forces, and ensures that our medically ready, uh, that our medical forces are medically ready uh, to deploy from a skills perspective as well. And with that, we expect to see improved readiness and uh, better health of our service members. Uh, the key points here, uh, is that the current staff will be distributed between those two functionalities. Uh, there will not be a growth in uh, the staffing at the hospital. Uh, so that'll be uh, exciting to try and execute that mission uh, with the same number of people. Okay, when is this effective? Uh, actually, this year, 1 October, or not, I guess last year, 1 October 2018, uh, the Defense Health Agency now owned my budget. It was actually passed to Navy Medicine, and then I execute that budget. On 1 October 2019, I'll be under full administrative and operative control of the Defense Health Agency from the military treatment facility standpoint. Uh, what do we promise you? One, that the transition will be smooth, it will be transparent, it will be seamless, we will be very busy, but you in the community, those that are our patients at the hospital, should see really from afar not a whole lot of activity uh, other than uh, better health, better access, better care. So, uh, so that is our promise to you. From the city of Jacksonville, I think it is uh, very important to kind of reach out to members of city council. And if there are ideas, if there is opportunity for partnership that, uh, that we can take advantage of during the, the transition period and in, in execution of this, we'd be more than happy to sit down with you and talk about that and see how opportunities can come forward. And with that, sir, I end my prepared uh, comments and uh, I am open for any questions or comments that you may have. One comment. Uh, you may recall that about a year ago, the city was contacted by the Naval Hospital to talk about the Stop the Bleed program. Uh, through Marty's work with the city manager's office, we have trained almost 200 of our city employees in specific techniques. Hopefully, we will never have to use them. But it assisted us so that uh, not only in a, uh, let's say, a, a social disturbance or societal disturbance where someone is shot, but also in things such as use of chainsaws where a person injures a leg or injures an arm. And we're very appreciative of what the Naval Hospital provided. It was great service. And again, uh, we trained about 200 of our personnel. Mr. Lazara, I saw you had a question, sir. I did not. I'm sorry. Would you like to have a question? No. <laughs> <laughs> Apologize for being here. <laughs> Would you like me to start over? No. <laughs> Thank you. Is the Stop the Bleed program so that's still an ongoing? Yeah, that will be an ongoing process. As a matter of fact, any of the memorandums of agreement, memorandums of understanding, whatever those relationships that already exist in either informal or formal basis will continue. We'll likely have to go back and redraft them just to make sure that the uh, you know, convening authority or the authority over those is proper. But other than that, we're looking to expand those relationships, not uh, pull away from them. That's From the great. standpoint of the trauma center, uh, how does that work? Uh, obviously, it works from the standpoint of personnel who are on the base, but how does the trauma center benefit uh, the personnel who live off the base, and how does it benefit the general citizens of the community? I'll tell you, the trauma 
program has been a tremendous benefit, just, not just for us from a training perspective, but really for the community in terms of improving the uh, care of traumatic injured patients. Uh, again, we are allowed to accept any patient. If uh, they come in an ambulance, we are absolutely uh, taking folks, whether they are military health system, you know, active duty family member, military health system, retiree, anybody on that, uh, from that perspective, as we always have. But any civilian that is injured uh, by whatever mechanism that qualifies as trauma, they have access to us as a trauma center. In the past year, we've had over 700 uh, trauma patients come to the, the hospital. Uh, about 60%, anywhere between 50 and 60% of those patients were actually our own beneficiary patient population. 40% were not. Uh, and so, again, from a community perspective, our goal is to, uh, again, enhance that program, make it as efficient as possible, and make it as much of a benefit to the community as it can be. So does the, uh, the first responders are the ones who determine whether they get sent, if it's a civilian, whether it qualifies for a trauma to go to, to y'all or whether it has to go to Oslo? Certain trauma Oslo doesn't even handle, I don't think. Huh? Certain trauma, I don't think Oslo handles. It goes directly to That's what I'm saying. I, I guess the first responders are the one who make the decision where to send somebody. Is, yes, that, is that correct? Yeah. So simple things. If it's a car wreck, if it's a, uh, a shooting, if it's you know, kind of obvious trauma, uh, that by requirement under EMS as a trauma center, they are required to bring that to the trauma center preferentially. Now, if it happens right in the parking lot of Onslow, probably be better that they take them right inside. But again, it's kind of one of those things where, you know, proximity and capability, depending on what that is. Uh, and there's some that fall into a little bit softer uh, categorization. Uh, if I'm an elderly person at home and I uh, get a little lightheaded and trip and fall down the stairs. You know, is that a medical slash injury from the fall? Is that a trauma? Well, there's trauma criteria that define whether that does qualify or not. Um, and so again, uh, we are, uh, we count on our EMS personnel to make that determination. And again, we'll take anyone who arrives at our door and, and, and care for them and get them in a stable condition. Whether we can keep them or not falls under Section 7, 717 of the NDAA 2017. That's a long lot of 17s <laughs> to be thrown out there. But uh, that uh, authorizes us for, uh, as a trauma center, uh, to accept trauma patients that are non-MHS beneficiaries and to continue with their care even in follow-up care uh, as outpatients after they're discharged from the hospital, uh, as long as they fall under that trauma categorization. If they don't fall into trauma categorization, then we speak with folks at Onslow or whoever their care provider was to where they would prefer to get their care. So, so there are some cases where we are authorized, there are some cases where we're not. Well, that's, uh, that's really great that the, you know, the Department of Defense and the Navy has reached out like that because I know all the years working in police were, you know, we were sending people left and right to New Hanover to be treated for trauma cases. And, you know, sometimes that, you know, that could be the difference between life and death for somebody. Uh, I know we had one of our police officers that was seriously injured in an automobile accident. And, you know, I remember having to fly him to New Hanover to be able to be, you know, treated for that serious trauma. But what is the, I'm sure there's some, is there some hard, fast guidelines that, that you go by as to what goes there and what don't go there? <laughs> well, medicine is the science of uncertainty. And, uh, uh, I would think, I would think that would be the case. Yeah. <laughs> the art of probabilities, right? So, um, yes, there are criteria. And sometimes those are easily satisfied uh, prior to them ever arriving at, at the hospital. Uh, sometimes patients will come and we're like, okay, is this a trauma? And we have to kind of sort through. And again, we usually, the, the tie goes to the runner and you, you, you decide what's best for the patient. You would do your typical triage or whatever oh, sure. and, and stabilize them and move them out. And some of those folks that you described um, that uh, would be shot or a car wreck or whatever it may be that were really badly injured, they may not be able to survive 
uh, the trip up to uh, you know, Greenville or to New Hanover. Uh, whereas if they stop with us, we can stabilize them, stop the bleeding, you know, control the, the injury, take care of whatever life, limb, and eye problems they have. And then the relationship we have with the aeromedical evacuation platforms is a tremendous benefit. And then sometimes they'll even come from the highway, not even stop at the emergency department, go right to our helo pad and, and fly them from there. So, so again, we are very flexible as to uh, what is uh, the, the best mechanism to get the patient to the best care available to them. And if they need it acutely, we're there to take care of it. If they need to get down the road, then we're happy to be the ones to facilitate the transfer, uh, even if that just means being on standby to make sure that they make it to the heel effect. Sometimes that's the plan, and they end up coming in because they were too unstable to get onto the bird. So, well, that's a great asset for the community, for the whole community, I tell you. Uh, I have an unrelated question. Do you got what? Who offers if you have within the base, whether it's a service member or family member that lives aboard the base, and they and they need uh, oxygen at the home or no equipment, medical equipment at the home? Do you guys provide that? And I have a reason why I'm asking that. Uh, we do not. Okay, uh, that's provided we, by yeah. a different service. Because I had a service contact me, and apparently they're one of the providers. Maybe there's several and. And um, they're having a difficulty getting on the base as a normal vehicle. They, I guess the base entrance is making them go to the Piney Green Gate. But they're responding to an oxygen alarm. <clears throat> and um, I guess there's so much time period that between the one beep or the two beeps, what have you. And I didn't quite know how to direct them. Um, but apparently they're, they're having to lose a lot of time to go back through the Piney Green Gate and they have normal vehicles. They're not like trucks or mm -hmm. is that, have you heard anything in regards to no, that? No, this is the first I'm hearing of that. The, the mechanism that we use for obtaining oxygen, any kind of durable medical equipment uh, comes for a consult for just that. It's a durable medical equipment consult. That consult goes in the system. Our referral management folks then, you know, talk with the patient, talk with, you know, where do you live? What's the best provider? Do you have somebody? Here's a list. Yeah, we don't pick for them. They pick amongst the, those available. I guess uh, the question is, should they have to go through that process or should they have access based on where the patient is? When I say access, obviously they have to go through the normal procedures to get the uh, identification cards and, you know, same as a contractor would. But should they have to be routed through the Piney Green Gate and waste all that time? Yeah, I and guess that's a, that's a medical, I guess. Yeah, it's more of a security. Yeah. Should we direct uh, them to you to discuss if, that, or if you want to, um, if I can give you my my okay. uh, email address, if you want to send that to me, I will contact the sergeant manager of the base because that's an installation issue. Yeah, that's okay. an installation okay. issue. You'd have to talk with them with their security and their military okay. police. I didn't know if you guys also provided that within the hospital and had a response system. But what we can do is, um, or what the medical provider can do is get contractor access to the base. And with that, they will give them instructions on how to get onto the base uh, without it being a delay. But we could contact somebody to find out if there's like a logistical problem as far as bringing oxygen onto the base. So we'll take care well, of it. Apparently what, ha what it is is that Let's just say there's a patient on the base, family member, whomever. I guess they're on oxygen. And the machine breaks down, and I guess there's a three-beep system, apparently. So he was got a call. They're on call 24 hours. He comes through the gate, whether I think it may have been Wilson Gate, because it's right there, Wilson Gate. And they would not let him through. They made him go to the Piney Green Gate because that's where all commercial vehicles are supposed to go through. And he was trying to explain to the gate that it was an emergency. He had to get to the patient and you know, blah, 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 that sort of thing. So I didn't know if there's a special category for that. And I think he contacted the mayor as well, from what I understand. Maybe that's something we need to put on our right. CPG list. Yeah. Yeah. Again, so, I, just, I was cool. wondering if maybe the hospital provided the same thing yeah. and, and had a quicker response. That sounds more like an installation, mm -hmm. like he said. The installation issue versus a what we can do is we will follow up from staff to staff uh, and see if we can find out how Thank to you. solve that problem. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question, Captain. Will this event I won't say eventually, 
I know retirees would be concerned about this consolidation and how it would eventually affect them, because I know a while back, some of those uh, retirees had to start getting services off base. So how do you, uh, I guess, deal with those concerns <coughs> of people having to leave, leave base as a result of this, this um, consolidation or where it looks like you going forward? Yeah. Well, in about 18 months, I joined the ranks of the retired, and I will be sharing that concern. <laughs> <laughs> Very long with you. But I got you. That's, Stay uh, tuned. Right? Yeah, that's right. Um, now, this should not affect uh, the access to for anybody with military health system benefits to have access to the hospital. Uh, we have limitations in terms of primary care. That's usually the challenge. Specialty care, we don't have all that many specialty care services to begin with. Um, and again, it, it's usually primary care is, is the bigger piece of that. Uh, if you look at the Navy's equities in that, they absolutely man, train, equip, ready, a medically ready force of 45,000 Marines. Absolutely, they have access to care. We have standards, we have to follow all that kind of stuff. When you now go to family members, beneficiaries, retirees, others, uh, Right now, we have access to be able to support as many of that, as many folks as we're able to. It's limited by physical space and number of providers. Uh, we generally sit uh, by Defense Health Agency guidance, 1,100 patients per provider. Uh, we're right now at about 1,400. Uh, what that hurts in is you call up and say, hey man, I'm sick, I need to get seen. I can't see you until a week from Thursday. Uh, by DHA, that's not an acceptable answer. We have to have uh, access to care for acute visits under one day. And so, again, if you look at the volume of uh, patients we're able to uh, accept, other than active duty, you know, that's where that comes into the balance. Uh, to counterbalance that, we do have a uh, accredited family medicine residency training program and that will not be going away. That is actually a big part of our force generation, future doctors for the Navy program. Uh, and with that, they must have a spread of patient types uh, across their residency training experience. So that requires us to have folks of retiree age within a certain percentage to be able to, um, to satisfy the requirements of the American College of Graduate Medical Education. So. Uh, so again, there, there are always those counterbalancing forces in that, uh, but we will always try to keep as many folks as we can. And again, some of those may fall into partnerships, uh, whereas we may not have an active duty provider to do it, but we're on contract a group to come in and provide those services even out of our own facility. So, thank you. Mayor? I'm sorry, no. Dr. I, will, I would like to bring up the rear, um, Captain, <coughs> and just let you know, um, immensely what your program or your hospital means to me um, as an educator at Camp Lejeune High School. Um, eight years ago when I started the health sciences program aboard um, Camp Lejeune, and then particularly at Lejeune High School, Lejeune High School has been in existence since 1945. And before I joined the faculty staff there, there was no program that actually allowed high school students to be able to ascertain training skills to become future healthcare providers. So when I started the program back in 2010, up until this time period, the Naval Hospital has been an exceptional role model and a collaborative partner that now affords military dependent children as well as civilian children the opportunity to train for their passion to become future health care providers. This has been a relationship that has been going on for eight years, and as an educator, I cannot begin to tell you just the wealth of experience that they learn from the Naval Hospital nurses 
and doctors, as well as other healthcare providers, and being able to assist in the care of active duty retirees and veterans <coughs> is just phenomenal for a high school student to be able to amass while they're still in high school and for that to set their trajectory to become future healthcare provider goes without saying. I want you to also know that um, in the Department of Defense, Lejeune High School is the only Dodea High School in the United States that offers this program and it happens to be on a Marine Corps base. The other programs are either on an Army base or it's on an Air Force base. So Camp Lejeune now has bragging rights to be able to have a program that offers young men and women the opportunity to gather national certification in addition to their high school diploma. So right now, since my program has started with the state of North Carolina, my passing rate for my students have averaged between 90 to 100%. And so we have 14 eager students that's going to be starting at the Naval Hospital in about three weeks. So I just want to let you know from an educator and also from a city council person, because the hospital is in my ward, I cannot begin to tell you the avenues and opportunities that this has afforded my students. And maybe in your power presentation, you can include this because not many military dependent children have this opportunity and to be able to have this for them it's it goes beyond what an average adult can think about particularly when you're talking about training young men and women while in high school to become future health care providers so thank you to you and your staff sir well thank you and uh, we shared uh, a couple of comments uh, before the meeting started and uh, absolutely I'm a I'm a hundred percent in your corner and uh, if anybody tries to put a block in that I'm happy to step in the way of that. <laughs> hey, members of council normally we don't take a break but to give you the courtesy of thanking these two wonderful people personally if you don't mind let's just take a two minute very short break so you can thank the captain and the command master chief. <laughs> All right. Thank you.
mid-sized general orders for mine. All right, we're going to go ahead and go back in session now. Mayor and Council, as you will recall, after Hurricane Florence left us, we provided information relative to the uh, recovery of the community. One of the comments that was uh, one of the follow-up items requested by the City Council was to learn more about the provision of natural gas. So they had the opportunity back in November to contact Mr. Lilly. He is a commercial and residential sales specialist. He's out of Newburn. And over the last several weeks, we've been able to coordinate this time. And we really appreciate Mr. Lilly coming down. And he's going to share with you general information uh, about Piedmont Natural Gas as a company and about the way they provide service. And I believe you're also going to talk about how a community can possibly request uh, gas to be brought into their community. So, Mr. Lilly, if you would please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so, Mr. Woodard asked me to come really and talk about where our gas lines were in the neighborhood uh, or in the city and, uh, and then what our plans for expansion were. Um, so, currently, um, currently, the major residential areas we have is uh, the Williamsburg Plantation area. We also have it uh, in the Carolina Forest. They are currently the only major uh, residential subdivisions we have. Commercially, we have it from a uh, yacht road all the way down the 17 corridor out to uh, Morton Trucking. Um, <clears throat> we also have the Western Boulevard corridor from from 24 all the way to Gum Branch. And then we have Gum Branch Road pretty much completely wrapped up. Um, some smaller areas, we've got a little bit of gas in the Northwoods area um, on the Carmen Avenue area and Clyde Drive. Uh, we also serve the high schools, um, Jacksonville high, high School. We have gas at all four marine bases or all four military installations, Camp Lejeune, uh, Montfort Point, uh, Geiger, and the River Air Station. Um, if we have gas in those areas, um, our tariff will cover you. You can call in, ask for natural gas. They'll send me out, and I'll just take some basic information and those customers, all they need to do is call in to their 800 number. They will put them in contact with me and they can get gas immediately. So there's no wait period. I don't have to create a project to get gas in the new areas. <clears throat> so in order to get gas in the new areas, in the new neighborhoods, uh, I either survey an area, which uh, I go into our mapping system, select uh, residential Areas, send a survey letter out, the homeowners receive it by mail and they mail it back to me. The stipulation for gas in a neighborhood is when we run our, our project, we need to make 8% return on our money, which in the grand scheme of things, that's not that bad. So I run the project, we get customers signed up for an agreement, and then within about three months is the timeline it takes to get the lines installed and customers operating on gas. What's the cost? You know, when the, when the city expands, uh, let's say certain services, we set up a taxing district and that's the way we recover our costs. You recover your costs through individual customers. Yes, but if you take an area like Northwoods where several council <laughs> members live and that's an area where we did get a request, you know, is it possible for Piedmont to bring natural gas to that area? Let's say that you have uh, 400 houses in an area. What are you looking for as far as the number of people who have to sign up in order to actually bring a project? So for every thousand feet, we typically need 10 customers. So if we've got 3,000 feet, we're going to need on average 30 customers. Um, our standard is one residential house Averaging 2,000 square feet with heat and water heat can get a hundred foot of gas line plus a service. And is there, uh, other than the, I would assume you have a connection charge and a monthly bill, but other than that, are there any other charges to the customer? Um, there is no connection fee. If we run a project and it's 8%, then we run the gas line at no cost to the customer. The monthly bill for the residential customer is $10, whether they use any gas or not. The only other cost the customer will incur is either conversion of, of their propane appliances or the installation of natural gas if they're switching out from electricity to propane. Now, electricity to the natural gas, excuse me. Is the $10 charge 
the maximum or is it a base of $10 and then how much you use? I mean, for example, if one family likes it at uh, 85 degrees and another family wants it at 60 degrees in the winter, they obviously use a different volume. So yes, is the sir. bill also based upon volume usage? It is. $10 is the minimum regardless, and then it's based on a per therm basis. Currently, natural gas is a dollar per therm, which if you're comparing to natural gas, I mean to propane, excuse me, it's like 90 cent a gallon. That's where your propane would have to be to be comparable. With the electricity, um, that number is about $1.35. So anything you're paying over that. What would you, and, I, and we're not getting specific, we just have a swag number here, please. But for a typical home in Williamsburg or Carolina Forest, you know, a family of four and so forth, what would you estimate their typical monthly bill is? A typical monthly bill during the summer months out there is about $20. That would uh, be their water heater and their cooktop. Uh, during the summer, we're looking at about $80 for to add the heat in. You mean winter. the winter? Winter. winter. During the winter months, it's about $80, uh, about $80 so a month. We'll overlook that since it's 75 <laughs> degrees here. On <laughs> so, I mean, it is uh, air conditioning. Yes. Yeah. So, again, uh, summer is about $20, and winter typically is about... 85. Okay. So, I have a question in regards. It seems so. Why did you guys just wondering why you picked Carolina Forest and Williamsburg Plantation as residential areas that you went into? Was it because it was new construction? Because Northwoods is a pretty heavily populated area, and or New River and other areas, Bryn Mawr, and none of those it residential areas. wasn't available then. Well, I'm, I'm wondering. Yes, why. sir. Um, why those New two construction selected. of that magnitude, the developer signs an agreement that he's going to build X number of houses and he's going to put heat and water heat in every house. So it easily meets our minimum return. So I'm, we are very open to, to run gas in Northwoods. It's just harder when people are living in their house and they've got a, a heat pump that currently works. Right. It's hard to get enough people at one time that's got a problem or willing to swap out appliances to make a gas line in a developed neighborhood feasible. Right. So if somebody, let's just say, wants service in Northwoods, they wouldn't be able to get it unless 10 or 20 other people elect to do the same? Correct. For the most part, we do have gas down Barn Street and there's some on Sioux Drive going to Northwoods mm -hmm. Elementary and Middle Schools. And then we've got glass on Clyde Drive and Doris and Carmen. Um, so, yes. Um, one thing I did want to mention was about our expansion plans. We currently, if you look on the screen here, the green green line, that's Piney Green Road. We have got a an approved project that estimated start date will be July of this year to run gas from Highway 17 all the way to the 24 corridor. So that is in plans. We're trying to get ahead of what we anticipate will be the commercial growth on, on Piney Green Road. Um, so that, that will be available. Uh, those customers can call now and sign up, and when we run the gas lines, their lines will be installed as we work our way down Piney Green Road. And not to be negative, but that's commendable because that's where the cash is. Well, I mean, to but be perfectly we... honest with you, sir, we are a privately traded company and that is we are in the business to make money we can't put gas lines in the ground just because people want it it has to be a, a money-making project for us okay i've noticed um in our neighborhood when people converted there's also been a sign in the yard that there was a private company that was said conversion by xyz what what is the private company Function. That is a contractor that comes in if you have a gas range or a gas heating unit, they change the orifices and the ability of that unit to operate on natural gas instead of propane. Oh, so he's, on the that particular the contractor knows that we're hitting that area and we're trying to put gas out there, so he's trying to piggyback and get his, his business you know, out there as well. I've often wondered, where does this gas come from? Do you have like a big storage thing? Is it, is it piped in from a tank somewhere or is it just continuously flowed? From it continuously flows from the wellheads. Mm -hmm. um, we do have some LNG plants for high demand times, 
um, but they are up in the Huntersville area, not not here. And your wells are located where? I mean, generally in eastern North Carolina? Or? No, well, some of our gas comes up from north of Elizabeth City, uh, West Virginia, uh, yeah, Virginia, West Virginia areas. And I'll be perfectly honest to say, I don't know where all of it comes from. We do have the Atlantic Coast Pipeline coming in that Duke Energy, which owns Piedmont, is a joint venture in. Um, so that will also help with cost of natural gas for long-term growth to keep prices low. And are your lines mainly on the rights of ways or, or DOT's rights of ways? Yes, sir. They either want to right away or purchased easements or granted easements. Granted easements. Yes, sir. Well, again, this is the type of service that a community really benefits from after a major storm. Mm -hmm. Now, I recognize that uh, if your house has uh, major roof damage and you can't live in the house, having a gas uh, cooking arrangement and a heating arrangement doesn't really work for you. But on the other hand, I know many of our residents that did not have damage to their home, did not have electricity, but they were able to have hot water and obviously cooking because they were on the Piedmont system. Yes, sir. And, uh, I think one of the things that we would encourage uh, the people who are watching out in television land is that if you're interested in learning more, uh, you can just simply contact the city. We'll also put on our website uh, information about how to contact Piedmont Natural Gas. Just a quick comment. I, uh, I see the line going, I, I guess that's going down into barn. That, uh, where we're also, are you planning on expanding as, as the city does some utility work on Henderson? You know, I'm, I'm on Henderson Drive on my mind here. We're, we're actually doing uh, water sewer utility work right now in preparation of repaving. And that would seem like a good time for, for y'all to put some empty lines or whatever if you want to do call them that while we're while we're digging the ground up the problem with that is if you put empty lines in the ground one you know there's no revenue generated and we are looking to generate revenue two if anybody does hit that line we don't know it so we can't put just empty lines in the ground so it's not like we can put down the empty conduits for future expansion for for uh for our Fiber communication, fiber optics, and so forth. Right, because Piedmont doesn't, we, one, we don't run in the conduit, and right, two, right. we, like I said, for safety reasons, we won't put it in the ground, so if it is cut, we'd right. never know it. So so then if you want to uh, expand up Henderson Drive, you have to put it off the right, or still in the right of way, but, but off the street or behind the back of the curb or whatever. Yes, sir, which we prefer to do anyway. We're okay. not going to be okay. under any streets, okay. or, okay. Um, but we would definitely um, have our own trench. Okay. And, um, well, that answer that question. <laughs> Other thoughts? We do appreciate Mr. Lilly coming down from New Bern. Uh, he's had uh, a very busy schedule, and his company has been impacted like everyone from the storm. But again, I know many people in the community have talked about converting. I'd like to remind people, though, it has to be cost-effective. I believe you said for every 1,000-foot uh, run, you need 10 customers. Yes, sir. So if you're thinking about uh, inquiring, you need to talk to your neighbors. We'll be happy to put you in contact with people. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. Thank you. Well, thank you. 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 Thank you although it's entitled transportation update at the joint meeting uh, anthony presented information to you and the county commission regarding projects tonight we're really going to focus though on updates on three areas but not necessarily transportation projects please thank you dr woodruff good evening mayor and council thank you for the opportunity to be in front of you again and i have to tell you as a uh, piedmont natural gas customer being in carolina forest doesn't matter how cold it is outside. <laughs> the furnace always works, and uh, my wife loves it. In fact, that's one of the main reasons why we decided um, to live where we live. All that aside, just wanted to bring you up to speed on a couple of things that are going on. Uh, we've been talking about buses for probably a better part of a year now. The good news is they're on the road. Hopefully you've seen them. Um, I personally feel that they're something to be proud of. A lot of folks have echoed that opinion. In fact, Richard was talking to somebody 
just kind of randomly on the sidewalk the other day to have you know, great things to say about the vehicles. Mm -hmm. Not only from an appearance standpoint, but they were transit riders and they felt that they just had a much better ride quality. So more durable vehicle, better looking vehicle. The name doesn't start with an F and end with a D, won't fill in the middle. Or anything else, correct? Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. They're Freightliners, they're not Fords, of course. So. <laughs> Ed loves these things, and that's that's really what mm -hmm. makes a difference because he's got to keep them on the road. Well, before you leave that, sir, we also want to remind the public that when we buy a vehicle of this nature, uh, the city is not actually the funding source. There is a sharing of funding. So a vehicle of this nature, how much does it cost? This particular vehicle costs about $133,000. And where do we get the money to pay for it? Well, 90% of the funding came from Federal Transit and from the DOT. Okay, we ended up funding about 10% of the cost. So uh, about 19 to $20,000. You do the math better than I do. Oh, even no, Gail, though, Gail, even Gail, Gail is here, right? <laughs> um, but again, this is a step up. You know, I make fun of the Ford, but we do have Fords right now. This is certainly a step up of that from that because of just durability, ride quality, etc. However, the cost of the vehicle is very comp comparable. To the vehicles that we were buying before so just a, 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 a step in the right direction no question we continue to make progress on jacksonville station got some pretty pictures here there's no question that this is in fact or will be once it's constructed a city building we've taken feedback from the city council from other stakeholders and this is basically where we are at this point we've got hundred percent drawings We've got some challenges to overcome, but the good news is, is that we still have a project. I mentioned 100% drawings. That doesn't necessarily mean that we're all done with the design, though. We're going through the value engineering process. We want to make sure that we're making the right decisions, not only on what we're building, but what that building contains. Um, we're hoping to have all that said and done here in February. But uh, we'll probably hold off on bidding the project until the end of this calendar year. The main reason is, is because Deanna says I can't build it in, in the fall. <laughs> Evidently, the water table's high, it rains a lot, so that causes lots of problems. Um, it also adds cost. We've realized that with other city projects. So uh, we're going to certainly take a recommendation there and not bid it until a time period where the weather is going to be best, the bidding climate is best, and also there's, in my opinion, some value in holding off for now to see kind of if the federal government starts to stabilize a little bit. You know, I hate to say it that way, but, you know, when shutdowns come, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of our money goes away. That just limits our ability to access the money. It's still there. There's just nobody on the other side of the system that we work through to actually say, okay, Jacksonville, here's your payment. You know, with a eight, $10 million project, we really would rather minimize that risk, if you know what I mean. Uh, if all of this comes to fruition, design or construction will begin in 2020. And, um, you know, the, the completion date is kind of hazy right now. What we're saying is fiscal 21, 22. Um, 12, what would you say, Deanna, 12, 18 month? A lot of that depends upon weather but we are not starting in the fall. Heard that loud and clear. <laughs> One of the main things that I wanted to bring to your attention tonight is that we've been working on a procurement process for our fixed route transit service. So most of you are probably familiar with the fact that the, the individuals that drive our buses are not actually city employees. In fact, those employees work for a contractor and our current contractor is MV Transportation. They've been with us since the beginning. When we started in 2007, they were the original contractor to provide that service. Um, we've renewed their contract, of course, that being through a competitive, a competitive process in uh, 2011 and 2016. And today we're coming towards the conclusion of that 2016 contract. We're in the final base year. So I wasn't here in 2007, but I could speculate that the main reason that we went with a contracted service versus saying hiring all the employees in-house 
was mainly because we were looking for some institutional knowledge. We were wanting to bring somebody in who immediately knew how to operate a transit system. At the same time, we wanted certain flexibility over that employee core. You know, if we wanted to ramp up on service, contractor could bring in employees from other areas to help supplement. At the same time, if something happened and we wanted to downsize, of course, that made it a lot easier working through the contractor than having all those employees on board. One of the other benefits, of course, is related to risk. The current contract requires the service provider to provide insurance on the vehicles. Of course, we also provide insurance on the vehicles because our employees drive them for maintenance and maybe special events and whatnot. But the contractor, the contractor's insurance is the primary insurance cover on the vehicle, uh, particularly when it's operating, you know, in commercial service. So when there's an incident, and there's, of course, not a question of if, it's a matter of when, because we put hundreds of thousands of miles a year on these things, um, the claim goes directly to the contractor. It doesn't come to the city. In fact, I don't recall a situation where we actually ended up subrogating a claim that all ends up going to them. So that certainly limits the element of risk on our part from an insurance claim perspective. The team has put in a lot of work on this solicitation process. Really can't describe to you how complicated it is to buy something. Well, maybe if you, maybe some of you already know how complicated and challenging it is to buy something of this scale with federal money. It requires a lot of effort. In fact, that request for proposals is something like 200 and, I mean, it's several hundred pages. So it's not light reading by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we, we sent it out in October. Um, proposals were due in December. We received two proposals. And because of the holidays and everything, there wasn't a whole lot of activity during December. Uh, we really kind of geared up the selection committee process in January. Here are the folks that participated on the selection committee. A great list of, of people. We know them all well. The main thing we wanted to encourage with this is that it wasn't Ron or it wasn't I on the committee. It was folks who are connected to transit, but not necessarily as closely. But also folks who have, like Carrie, who's in the back row over here, who have experience in operations, right? Folks who also have experience Ed, in maintaining the buses and working with contractors like this, contracting, purchasing, it was just a well-rounded group and they did an awesome job for us. The results, again, we received two bids. One was uh, from Onslow United Transit, commonly referred to them as OUTS, right down the street. And Carol's in the back row there. Uh, First Transit was the other bidder. You can see that they were extremely close. And so we feel that like we got pretty decent pricing. Interestingly enough, we did not receive a bid from the incumbent contractor. Typically, well, it's customary to think that you need three bids in order to move forward on something like this. But given the fact that it's a service contract, we do not require three bids and neither does the federal requirements. Okay? So really all we have to do is make sure that we feel that we have competitive pricing and then at the same time, make sure that both of the contractors are equally responsive, meaning that they touched all the points required by the RFP and that they are also responsible, meaning that theoretically, based upon what you're reading, they could implement terms of the contract. Anthony, do you Sorry. have any indication why MB would not want to continue? I'll get to that in just <laughs> a second, sir, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Recommendation from the committee, and this is a recommendation that I support, was for First Transit. Now you notice that First Transit was not the lowest bidder, but it was very, very, very close. Um, not speaking on their behalf, but kind of inferring what I've read, the committee felt that there was more value in the proposal from First Transit than there was from Onslow United Transit. And what do I mean by that? more experience in this particular type of operation. You can see on the screen there, 335 fixed route operations throughout the world. First Transit has seen 
you know, very commonly as being at the forefront of public transportation, period. Uh, the key personnel that they're bringing to, t to the table, folks that are going to be in Jacksonville supporting us daily, as well as those, you know, uh, in the background that can come forward as needed, you know, this is what they do for a living, period. This is what most of them have done for their entire career. Um, and then what, one of the things that really grabbed me personally was the fact that, in, that uh, First Transit is proposing a driver core that is mostly made up of full-time drivers. These are full-time drivers with benefits. And from our experience with MB, because of course that's our own, only point of reference, we tend to get better customer service out of full-time benefited employees. Now that certainly isn't a rule, that's just a generalized statement. There are excellent part-time drivers out there, but we do tend to get better customer service representation on our behalf of full-time drivers. One other kind of footnote here, just to show you how far they are and how deep they are into the subject. On the right-hand side is a uh, prototype. It's actually in service right now. This is an on autonomous transit vehicle. So they are operating these services now, and they are also at the forefront of autonomous vehicle research. So, you know, it's, it's a large company with tons of institutional knowledge in this particular field. So let's talk about budget impact. First Transit again came in at about 914,000. The current MV transportation contract, fiscal 19, is 650000 okay? That's a pretty steep increase. There are a variety of reasons, but I would say that the primary reason is because of wages. We've struggled for years with the MV contract and obtaining or hiring and retaining drivers. When this 2016 contract started, the base wage was $8 an hour. We worked with them to bring that up to 10. That's where we stand today. The market competitive wage right now is $12.50. And so what's happening right now is that they're onboarding people, they're staying for a period of time, and then they're moving on. This being a majority, uh, a majority wage contract, meaning we're paying for labor here and not really any kind of product, so to speak, that's where the significant increase comes in. <coughs> I also mentioned to you, and, and I don't mind sharing this because MV has told me on multiple occasions, they haven't made any money on our contract since 2016. It's certainly not our fault. That's a business decision on their, their part. But to get to Mayor Pro Tem's question, I think that is the reason why they did not provide a, a proposal. And were they, did they bring in their own people or did they hire locally, do you know? Well, again, I wasn't here when they first started, but I would say it probably was a little bit of both. Everybody but the manager was local. Okay, well, there you go. <clears throat> There's the answer. And so my, quite, my next question is, mm -hmm. first transit, are they providing you mentioned all those are full-timers. Are they going to be trying to hire a local as well, or are they bringing in a crew of their own? It's, a, it's basically the same answer as before. Yes, they will be hiring uh, an employee, a driver core locally, and they've told us that they're going to start with the current transit drivers. Okay, um, so you know, they would give them <laughs> first choice to either accept or not, uh, but then they will be bringing in a general manager from the Durham area. What are, and what are they paying? Would they be paying twelve twelve fifty? Is that what the you're... the entry rate is twelve dollars and fifty cents? And to put that in perspective, our our largest competitor right now, and where a majority of our drivers are going, is the school system. Okay, they're struggling for drivers as well. Their base rate is fourteen dollars and forty one cents an hour. And you can go see that on their website. It's it's very clearly posted. The, the difference why we think 1250 works for us is because when we priced it internally, meaning we sent the job requirements to HR and said, if we were to hire all these people, what would we pay them? They said about $12.50. Uh, but also, the school system is only a part-time gig, okay? So, you know, there's some pros and cons there. 1250 full-time benefited versus 14 
40 some you know part time not benefited there's some value in that at 1250 mm -hmm. certainly so what you describe the contract as providing insurance and drivers i mean that's what you get that's right basically okay. management service the driver core insurance and there's you know some various other paperwork type of activities that they that they provide they do um, on-road management, they track on-time performance and stuff like that and report all those metrics. Well, Can well, you talk well, to the well, people well, in the transit yeah. as to why they didn't bid? We were in the middle of the procurement process. They gave me inclinations before this started as, you know, the loss that they had experienced before was the main reason. But since the procurement is ongoing, I haven't talked to them about that. I'm just wondering, uh, you know, there's a significant difference there in money. Mm -hmm. I mean, did they have any idea that we would pay three hundred thousand dollars more? Well, to be very candidly with to be very candid with you, I, I think that ship has somewhat sailed with MV what transportation. The um, it's been very challenging in working with them recently. Okay. I mean, if they're not meeting our requirements, then they're not meeting our. I guess that's what my next question was: is mm -hmm. is there was there a performance issue with MV transportation? as part of the evaluation process and if so are there different requirements that you've set for the new people as part of your procurement the base contract is essentially the same okay as the one that they're performing under today okay. um, it has been modernized in some very minor ways but those really don't affect the those those minor adjustments would not affect the but the baseline cost I just want to make sure that we are very transparent in what we're sure. doing they were very much aware. In fact, we called them on the phone to tell them that the solicitation was going out. We spoke with them <coughs> since um, about the solicitation, but I didn't want to get into questions of, you know, why you didn't bid. Okay. I think, you know, once we get a little bit further down the road, we can certainly go back and cover that ground. But right now, probably not as, it's probably not the right time. I will tell you, though, that my calculations based upon what I've heard from them is that they're losing about two hundred thousand dollars a year on the contract. So I mean that gives you a little bit of comfort in the fact that you know nine hundred thousand is a high number. It's much higher than where we are today. But if MV were to be in a profitable situation right now, meaning in the black, they would be around that number anyway. Refresh our memories and that of the people watching on TV. Yes, sir. What's the funding sources for the cost of the contract? So just like the question before about buses, it's 50% uh, instead of, well, let me start that it's again. It's not the same. It's not the same formula. <laughs> it's the same revenue sources, just a different formula. So the revenue sources are FTA and the state of North Carolina DOT, and then, of course, general fund. And fares. Well, and fares, yes. Fares come off the top of all of our operating costs. So 50% of the total cost is offset by the federal government, FTA, 25% by the state, and then the, the city's residual amount for local obligation is 25% is, uh, as well. Now, what does that actually mean in general fund impact? Roughly $66,000. Additionally or? Additionally. Additionally, yes, sir. This would be in addition to what is currently contributed from the general fund. Well, $198,000. That's what we I mean, generally, that's we're, we're paying somewhere in that range. If, you'll, if you will note, I'm sorry, that's, that's, uh, that's the number that's on the screen here. Let's go back. The operation that we contract for is only for personnel and management. Doesn't cover gas, doesn't cover parts, doesn't cover vehicles, doesn't cover tires. That is covered by the city through the same funding sources with the federal and state and city. Now, as, as Anthony said, there are different formulas. For personnel and operating cost of personnel, there's one formula. For capital, there's another formula. And that's where we got into the discussion with the buses. Uh, I gave you the wrong number. What's the correct amount that in the FY19, which ends June the 30th, mm -hmm. what's the current amount of money that the city puts into the contract with MV? 
I don't have the contract. Well, it would be okay. half a six fifty. Right. That that would be the amount that goes into MV in total. But as far as the transit operation, the general fund obligation today is around three hundred eighty six thousand. And it's going to go up by sixty six thousand. Yes, sir. To four something. That's assuming that we move forward with the contract. One and one of the things that Anthony did somewhat of an analysis if. If we were operated in house, so he basically, like you mentioned, he got the positions graded, attached salaries to it, did some calculations, and Anthony, that estimate for an in-house operation. Was well, the in-house operation was about a hundred thousand dollars less than what's shown for First Transit. But with that, of course, comes the overhead of hiring the employees, you know, the things that we talked about, the benefits of having the contractor, those are all kind of somewhat hangups of bringing it in-house. That is certainly an option. What's the insurance cost? You're talking about some services and insurance. How much, how much is there, how much of an expense is that insurance? Did Perfect. you factor that into the, the 100,000 short or was that just strictly on, on providing manpower? So that was, you're talking about for- If the city- If the city, yes. Yeah, if the city, well, we already pay for the insurance today. The insurance but, but, rate but, wouldn't but, actually change. Or the workman's comp, that's what it, that's workman's comp. Oh, yes, certainly, yes. The workman's comp was factored into that into that evaluation, yes. What well, the so insurance that was, would change too, when it would, since MV is primary. Mm -hmm. Well, we contacted the, you're talking about actual vehicle insurance? Yeah, liability. We, liability. The liability insurance. Um, we contacted the well, league. I thought that's what you were talking about. You talk of workers, that yeah. workers comp too. So Mr. Warden's question was related to personnel and workmen's okay. comp. No, no, mine was, to, mine was okay. insurance. Sure. Uh, mine was a catch-all insurance question. Okay, I got turned turn around a little bit. So to answer your question, we currently pay, if we were to bring it in-house, or if we were to execute the current the contract proposal, our insurance rate would not change at all for operating the vehicles. If we were to bring it in-house, there would be an additional cost for workman's comp. And that's just because we would be adding employees to the core. And when you did the analysis of in-house versus out-house, mm -hmm. you did agree, you did include the workers' comp cost oh, certainly. in that analysis. That was a fully allocated cost estimate, so it included all aspects of drug and alcohol training, uh, or excuse me, testing, uh, background checks, required training. I mean, like I said, it was a fully allocated cost. What was that cost. number, Anthony? It was roughly $100,000 less than what we've shown on the screen here. So, so if we ran it ourselves, your projection would be in the eight hundred thousand. It's uh, eight hundred and thirty-four thousand dollars. Eight hundred thirty-four thousand uh, dollars. I got tongue tied here. Okay. Eight hundred thirty-four thousand dollars. We'll just call it that. And then we would have to take on the role of hiring and firing and managing yes. and all that. These numbers have been through HR. Um, they've also been through finance, so we're, we're fairly confident of these numbers. Would you need a uh, Would you need an additional personnel to manage the day to day routes and the people? As you know, that some, is, that that's, is that's included in there. That's okay. included in this estimate. Okay. So, so it any, would end up any, being any management personnel is included in that. That's right. Needed. So okay. it would be a total of twenty two people, most of them being drivers. We would have. Let's see, two dispatchers, two full-time dispatchers, two part-time dispatchers, and basically one operations manager. What we can do, uh, to be quite frank with you, uh, when Anthony uh, reviewed the initial data, we asked him to also uh, show counsel what would it be if we did in-house. But I did not feel as the manager that you would support an in-house option because you have the issues of cost of living adjustments every year mm -hmm. and, and, and. Retirement and, and, you know, and. So uh, what we will be happy to do is in the very near future, bring a workshop that shows you all the detail. I will say to you though, I do not believe that there is enough financial gain to the city to expose you to the risk that you would lose from a contract. One of the great things about a contract of service on this is the fact that you have guarantees built into the contract. You know, this is not an issue of service level. 
We did have some service issues with MV. They're a good company. I don't want anybody in television land to think that we're speaking negatively about MV. The problem was MV negotiated a contract that they found was not in their best interest. They did come to us more than a year ago and ask us to raise the rate of the contract so that they could pay their drivers more because the problem was they could not find drivers. We looked at that and said, why? Why? You, right. you have a contract with us. Why should we spend more taxpayer money to simply help you out? And uh, to be quite frank with you, I think that that's why MV didn't even compete is because they were afraid that whatever they asked for, we wouldn't, we would not consider. What is the contract period? The base contract would be for three years, and then there would be there would be two uh, optional annual extensions. So, so for potential. a total of five years, potential. Any escalator clauses? Three percent a year. Three percent. Yeah. And it and it your current contract expires into the fiscal year. Is that correct, June thirtieth? The new contract would need to be in place July first. Yes. Again, my only reason for asking is knowing the upcoming impacts that we have on our budget cycle to 66 why not why it may not seem like a lot is well it's another layer on the challenge we're going to talk about later tonight <laughs> i know we are that's why i mentioned it. well and, and this I, I agree with you 100 percent though a contracted service for this i think would be the best for, for the for the every, every time we've we've looked at contract and we've thought about in-house but what got us to go to a contractor is hiring somebody that had bent strength and experience in depth right. in running a transportation system. And that's one of the things that, again, somebody like First Transit has. You know, if there's a problem, they've got expertise within the company to bring to bear on the problem and things like that. <clears throat> we certainly can't underemphasize the flexibility with the employee core. We don't necessarily have that same level of flexibility. And then as Richard mentioned before, the risk, you know, having them as their first, uh, our first line of insurance uh, liability is very important. So I personally feel that this is the, the best direction forward. We can certainly look at maybe adjusting the way that we operate to bring that number down if in fact we need to do that. But again, I think First Transit is probably our best option at this at this particular moment. Let's, let's also take a moment, and it's not because Carol's here, but uh, Ounce does a very good, I started to say Ounce does an outstanding job, but that would almost be inappropriate. But they do a, a, an outstanding job for our community. It was a tough decision. Ounce runs a professional operation. We were just not sure that they were ready for this level of leap. And given the fact that uh, this other company is already in Wilmington, they're already in several places in North Carolina, the overall strength of what they have, the bids were so close together and we don't have to look at, while well, money is a, a factor, it's not a low bid. Now, we're not asking you tonight to decide one way or the other. What we're doing is giving you information because in the very near future, there will be an agenda item that you will have to approve. So what we're asking tonight is for you to accept this information, identify additional information that you would like to have. For example, we will verify exactly the amount of money that the city is subsidizing the transit in FY19. We'll also verify that amount for FY20 if you approve the contract. Secondly, we will also give you the details of the city operated system. If you want a workshop on that, we'll provide it. Otherwise, we will simply provide it in, in written form so you can at least look at the analysis. I'd like to say, I think that you know, you're right that we're not going to do better than contracting. I think if we remember, we had a, whenever you make an estimation on something you've never done before, i.e. commercial <laughs> sanitation. You can put the numbers on paper of what you imagine is going to happen, but rarely, rarely does it happen like you expect. There's always the unexpected. 
I, I, I don't need more information on the city doing it. Good point. I'm well, it, 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 that, is, that is certainly one of the factors that's gone into this recommendation. And, and in fact, you're not the only one to have said that. Wally's over there shaking his head, Gail shaking her head. <laughs> so I think you may want to look at how to reduce that number because of the We can certainly do that. that. We're going to have coming yes, sir. up. That's so it's the only suggestion that I would make at this point. What that represents is if we were to operate the system 100% as it is today, I think there are some efficiencies that we can work on to potentially bring that number down. There's still going to be an increase, but we can look to moderate that. Um, ideally, and just this is just a last slide on this particular subject, um, ideally we'd like to have contract approval in February. It doesn't sound like we're on that path, at least at this particular moment. So we might delay that a little bit until we can get more information and do a better analysis on maybe reducing that $66,000 obligation. We do have some flexibility in the timeline here because you see mobilization really isn't going to start until April and then the transition formally would occur in, in May and be complete 1st of July. One other point that I want to make about First Transit, and it's something that um, it really kind of brought it home for me. They've done something like 40 of these transitions in the past two years, meaning where one there was an incumbent contractor and they had to come in and actually take over the service, stand everything up and, and make it work. Uh, some of those were very emergency type transactions, meaning the contractor just left town and they had to come in and pick the whole system up in a very short period of time. So that, that is certainly one of the factors that, that goes into this recommendation as well. I was hoping B doesn't do the same. Losing 200, you can't. Well, after a while, you can't handle but so much losing. Now, was that a sports commentary? <laughs> <laughs> Man, you know take how to cut. Don't you? Take, <laughs> take it how you will. One more slide. One other end on a positive. We're going to end on a positive <laughs> note here. Okay. This may live. Everybody who lives in Northwoods. Well, here it is. So I've been here for almost nine years, and for almost nine years, I've been hearing about the need for a traffic signal at this location. This is um, Gum Branch Road at Plantation Boulevard. Okay. And in fact, Mr. Lazar, I think this was the first subject that we ever even talked about together was this intersection. Um, it's taken a long while, but we've convinced DOT that a signal is warranted here. It's primarily because of the capabilities of our traffic engineer. It's under construction now. It may not look like it, but we set the foundation today. We're pulling conduit, and this should be up. Our goal is by the end of this month, uh, if not next month. So. I have to put in a plug for Thank Mr. You. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's my pleasure. That's why we're here. I have to put in a plug for Mr. Alford, though. He helped us get some money uh, through his discretionary program to actually make this happen. Well, th this has become even more of a pressing need with the development that's actually gone on outside right. of the city. You know, yeah. when you have, you know, the morning and the evening, you know, mm -hmm. rush hours, I mean, it's just, it's almost impossible to, for anybody to get out of there. And it's just a matter of time before, you know, someone were to get hurt. So we, I was out there with, um, with Jones Onslow probably six weeks ago to talk about this project. And almost every person that pulled up to this left turn stop bar right here, you know, when I was, we were standing over in here, every, every person, every other person basically said, y'all putting up a traffic signal out here? <laughs> That was the question, and I think think they were very happy with the answer is yes. That's what we're working on. You know, one of the probably the most useless things endeavors we ever do was the right in, right out, because that has never worked. That's not observed. You're talking about the one down here? Yes. Yeah. It doesn't work at all. Because that center lane there is meant for people to turn left on the plantation, not to turn left into that road that entrance or that exit there but what you have is you have cars meeting in that center lane and that's causing problems. one benefit of this signal project is that all the pavement markings in this area are going to be changed and in fact one of the downsides right now is that little arrow right there so it gives you the impression that you can make that conflicting left turn even though you're not supposed you to sandblast <laughs> we will of course it's going to be ground down actually another bit of good news is that gum branch road is going to be resurfaced this year hopefully this summer 
So we'll have brand new asphalt, brand new pavement markings, everything up in it. One thing I would like to point out to you, to hold down the cost, there will not be mast arms. As you can see, they're span wire. At least at this point. Correct. Um, there is a tip project in this area, and at some point we'll probably look at mast arms. But also to keep down the, um, the cost, and also to emphasize our collective partnerships with Jones Onslow and, and DOT, we're building the thing. City crews are building the signal. DOT is providing the equipment. We did the design work. Jones Onslow is putting in the poles. So really, this is all hands on deck type thing. <coughs> That's going to keep the cost extremely low. And, and get the signal. You brought up the subject of pavement markings. Sir, what's the schedule for that? For the re I resurfacing here? No, no. Pavement uh, okay. markings. Yes, sir. Turn signal indications and lane markers. Mm -hmm. See a lot of them around the city are really in bad shape. Faded odd. Yes, sir. <coughs> so um, that's a challenging question to answer. It depends on whose pavement markings it is and what's going on at the time. For instance, there are a lot of really bad pavement markings on Cumber Ranch right now. In fact, what you see here on the screen is actually better than what they are today. The reason that they haven't been refreshed is because DOT knew that they were going to come through resurface and put down fresh markings. Um, in other cases, you know, it's as simple as us just picking up the phone and calling DOT to go out there and, and make some improvements. In fact, uh, DOT actually has a, a great new system. It's online. You just fill out a form, you send it to them, and they're obligated to respond within 48 hours. So that whether it's mean they're going to mark it within 48 hours, it just means they respond. Well, for a pothole, they are required to fill it within 48 hours. So that's an excellent resource. One other thing that we would also mention is when Anthony looked at this project and we talked about the mast arms, we checked on the delivery schedule for mast arms. And because of storm damage and other things, if we did go to mast arms, I believe you said it would delay the project by it's a minimum year out. So 12 months at least to, to just get the, to take delivery of the equipment. That's not to construct the foundations, install the equipment, all that Spam kind of stuff. Spam work works just fine. <laughs> works for me. I mean, it's actually easier for us to maintain. They're not as durable through, you know, weather. Hurricane might take it out, but yeah. it'll be all right. The lights will change color, that's for sure. It'll work. Great work. Thank a you. A lot of people very are going to appreciate it. Very, very Yes, sir. Much. How about we take a break? And we'll come back for some other items. Let's take a break.
Okay, Dr. Winter, we're back in session. I'd like to talk with you for a moment about the Unified Development Ordinance and a particular and a potential text amendment relative to contractor offices. This was reviewed by the Planning Advisory Board in the recent meeting, had very good discussion. And what we'd like to do is get direction from you as the city council before we bring this in ordinance final form. Uh, Ryan, if you would please review the issues. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. Good evening, Mayor Council. Um, as Dr. Woodruff stated, we did have a very um, lively discussion with the Planning Advisory Board, and, and we feel like this uh, issue was vetted very well by the Planning Board. But before we put our final touches on a proposed ordinance amendment, we felt like we wanted to bring it to city council and um, get any feedback that you may have before we finalize that. So we've had, it's, uh, dealing with unified development ordinance amendments, we, this is kind of our process and how we kind of analyze whether to bring one forward. Uh, in this particular case, we've had a lot of uh, businesses come to us and say, hey, we want to open up a contractor's office, primarily in the quarter of commercial zone. And, you know, we adopted the unified development ordinance back in 2014 in a contractor's office for building mechanical Heating and plumbing is only permitted in the industrial zone and especially use in the quarter commercial zone. And we have a lot of folks that are looking to go in the quarter commercial zone. So we tried to find a way um, after evaluating our ordinance and looking at current locations, um, we compared their uses and impacts and proposed uh, an ordinance amendment. And uh, that's why we're here tonight. Uh, we've drafted an amendment we vetted it through the Planning Advisory Board. We want to talk to you this evening, and then we'll bring this to you in a public hearing uh, for a final decision, most likely at your, your um, second meeting in February. So I'm going to go through some pictures and show you conforming and non-conforming contractors' offices here in Jacksonville. We're going to use Jacksonville examples. So this is a contractor's office in the industrial zone, so it's conforming. Everything about it is, is acceptable. Permitted use, uh, zoning is up to, to uh, compliance, so no issues with this currently. This is a non-conforming uh, contractor's office. This is on Belfork Road right near Highway 24 and Belfork Road. And the reason for it is it's zoned quarter commercial. So it's been there, it's a legal non-conformity, which means it was there, our ordinance changed, which is what's created the non-conforming situation. They also have um, some storage in the rear as uh, in this area here, uh, construction trailer, their vehicles, could be equipment. Another example here next to the Smithfields on Gum Ranch Road. This is an existing uh, location, been there for a long time, this is uh, Jacksonville Heating and Air. You know, they have a fenced in stored area for their, their vehicles. Um, POVs, work vehicles, et cetera, but it's a contractor's office. It is also non-conforming because it's zoned quarter commercial. Here's another one. Because of the Unified Development Ordinance, it's been there a long time. They recently renovated before the Unified Development Ordinance. Non-conforming just because of the zoning aspect. And if you look, a lot of these, they look like typical professional office buildings. They can have some storage, uh, you know, at the, at the side of the rear, and that's some of the concerns that we were going to raise and how we deal with those issues. So before you, before you go there, go back one. The reason why many of these uses became non-conforming is that when we discussed with council in 2014, the new unified development ordinance and the zoning map, we agreed that the simplest way to do it was a direct conversion. That if you were in the, in the commercial zone, and you were whatever the old zone was, let's say it was C2, that it would automatically move to corridor commercial. But what the challenge or what the issue created there was the use table changed. So your land use may have been commercial too, and it became corridor commercial. But the uses allowed in C2, not all of those uses were brought forward in corridor commercial. And what the direction from the council at that time was, don't go in and start rezoning individual pieces of property. Just make a straight conversion, commercial to commercial. So keep going. Right. So currently, the use table in the Unified Development Ordinance identifies 
the building, heating, plumbing, electric contractors. It's a special use here and permitted in the industrial zone. So the industrial zones are highlighted here in purple. So that's the only <coughs> area in which they could go permitted. This is the quarter commercial zoning areas where it would require special use. You can see there's a lot more areas that are zoned quarter commercial than industrial. Put those two areas together. So these are the only properties that, that we're talking about currently that allow contractors offices either permitted or with a special use permit. What staff has identified and planning board was in agreement was to create two standards. A office for contractors without any outside storage, make it a permitted use, um, a specific additional uh, use specific standards here under E2A, which we'll talk about here in just a moment, but make it a permitted use. There's no outside storage. It looks like a normal office building. The second piece would be those that have outdoor storage. So the secondary category, we would still propose that that be a permitted use, but once again, add specific standards associated with the outdoor storage component. So in neither case, it would become a special use permit and have to go through the government process. That's correct. It would be permitted. Staff would be able to approve it, provided they could meet those additional standards. On this particular issue, the planning board and staff both were in agreement. This is dealing with outdoor storage, I mean, without outdoor storage. So any contractor's office can have heavy trucks with, um, they're, they're limited. You cannot have a truck that's a heavy vehicle that exceeds 20,000 pounds, multiple axles, et cetera. So there's none of this that would be permitted at that location. So that's an option. I don't have any outside. I don't have any equipment. So this is just a, an easy provision for them. <clears throat> right now, they couldn't go there at all. So this is opening up an opportunity. However, we know that some people need the outside storage areas for vehicles and equipment. So the planning board and city staff agreed with everything but this first piece. So I'm going to give you the staff proposal first, and then I'll read you what planning board suggested that we, so I'll show you the pr first proposal and the refinement. So with the outdoor storage, that they, the outside storage area shall be located to the rear of the principal structure and be screened with a wooden fence or masonry with no less than eight feet in height in accordance with section 5.4 fences and walls of the Unified Development Ordinance. The height of materials and equipment stored shall not exceed the height of the screening fence or wall. This area should be used for heavy trucks with more than two axles or that exceed 20,000 pounds for uh, vehicles, trailers, equipment. So if you have a typical work van, you could park that out front. You don't have to park that in the rear. But if you have a heavy vehicle, then you would need to. I highlighted the, the specific areas here because that's the piece that uh, city count of the planning board had concerns with along with the use. Um, so the planning board basically stated uses within the quarter commercial zone. That's important because that means that this wouldn't even be applicable for the industrial zone. And I'll show you what that kind of means here in a moment. Um, let me undo the that red line didn't work very good. So only for the quarter commercial zone. It talks about the storage at the rear of the principal building still. And it says a fence or wall. So it's no longer masonry or wooden. It's any type that's listed under our ordinance. So it gives them more opportunities. And we explained to the planning board that any fence greater than six feet has to be designed by an engineer because of the building code. So you can see here that they propose to knock that down to six feet. Everything else basically remained the same as far as this particular issue. So you got a staff proposal. You have a planning board proposal. There's another option that could be considered, and that is no fence at all, or a combination of fence plus landscaping. At this time, we did not propose any landscaping, but that's obviously something that the city council may look at the staff and say, well, we need to add some landscaping components to this um, as well. The other standards, which there were no concerns with by the planning board, is that you cannot locate the storage areas within the required setback, a perimeter lawn, or required buffer. The materials, equipment, vehicles, and or similar items shall not be used, uh, parked or stored as a source of parks. 
basically where they're cannibalizing the, the, the former equipment and becoming, in essence, a junk area. And that the use shall be designed to ensure that the vehicles can maneuver. So with the staff proposal, this contract yard would become conforming. So if they needed lending or if it burned down or was damaged or destroyed, they'd be able to put their office back here. It just simply has non-conforming site features because of the, the area that's here. There's no screening. So an easy fix if they ever reach compliance. They wouldn't have to do anything with this ordinance amendment. It would only have to be brought into compliance if they were renovating or expanding the site. Another example, once again, this site would become conforming. They, they have some non-conforming site features because they don't have a screen, a screen wall. Now they have a, a fenced yard. They could add some screening material to make that screen and compliance with this at this site would be fairly easy. And these are just some, some examples. There are, are obviously much more throughout the city, but we just chose these um, because they were in a close proximity just to kind of allow you to go out and look if you wanted to in a close proximity to one another right here near Gum Ranch and Doors. Once again, uh, this use would become conforming. It just would have non-conforming site features. That is with the staff proposal or the, or the planning board proposals? This would be both. There's only one that where there would be a difference, and I'll get to that here in just one moment. Why? What? I don't recall. Why, why would that be non-conforming site feature then? With the, the fence? The screening. The screening. They could put the material, the... the well, is, that what, the is, that, is that what the fence, is that what that, the 5.4 yes, census sir. requires? An a, opaque fence. Requires an opaque fence. Okay. All right. I got it clear in my mind. But, but right now, if they closed down for 180 days and another contractor wanted to go here, we would have to tell them they could not go there. So yeah. I mean, it really opens up the ability that they do not have currently. I think the first question is the issue of allowing the use Forget anything else about fencing, storage, anything. Are you in favor of having the use allowed in commercial corridor? Because if you are, you know, we need to, to change the text from special use to simply a permitted use. <laughs> the second is, if you're going to allow them, do you want to have any fencing, screening, amenities? That's the second question. But you only hear <coughs> the second question if the first question is, you're comfortable having contractor has been explained those things in the corridor commercial. Not a, not any problems with it? We have them already. <coughs> so based on that, this is kind of a thumbs up. We need to make this change and we'll bring that part forward. Although we will answer this question here in just one moment. So for the without outdoor storage, this just allows them to park their vehicles in their parking lot as long as they're typical vehicles, vans, trucks, uh, cars, just not heavy equipment, heavy vehicles. It's okay with that in, as a permitted use and as a standard. All right, and then the next piece is going to be the difference between the staff, the original staff proposal that we took the planning board and what they're recommending, which is the eight foot reduction to six, and it opens up the fence or wall materials. And that basically the only place this would be applicable would be your quarter commercial zone. This would not apply to a contractor in the, in the industrial zones. Now, there may be some industrial zones that staff will bring forward to city council like we've done in the past, where, bless you, where there's some industrial zoning that we feel should be zoned quarter commercial versus industrial. That's a separate discussion at a later date. I, I, thought, I thought that the uh, consensus of the planning board was that they did not necessarily have to have a screen. Fence, they were, they were fine with the chain link fence, no, no screen, and I don't, I mean, I may not be remembering perfectly, but I, my, my understanding was that they were fine with regular chain link fence. And I think that was for the industrial piece, that they didn't want to make them go through the additional screen. I, I do remember talking about the difference between the industrial. I do remember that. 
So, but on the corridor commercial, which could be on Western Boulevard, Gum Branch Road, that on those corridors, which are a little bit more visible, we would want some sort of a screen wall or fence. Do you mind? Do you mind going back and review Come that? On. You know, just just go back and review that. I know it's you know go up just to see that sure. that's in fact. I, 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 I'm. You may be right, and I'm just not I'll be, sure. I'll be happy to look at that. Okay. And I think that's one of the homework things that we would like for you all to take on. You know, the, when you have uh, the outside storage, how do you feel about just open chain link fence? Or do you want it to have slats in it where you can't see through it? Or do you want to go to the point of requiring them, requiring them to be wood or requiring them to be masonry? Because, you know, it is about the aesthetics. And while one thing might work well in one location, Maybe it's not what you want because we are talking about the appearance of the community. Now, in a case like this, and I have no idea whose office that is, but in a case like that, hey, what's the issue? Open chain link looks acceptable. I mean, you know why? But what we encourage you to do is ride the commercial corridor that's primarily, uh, you know, you've seen the corridors, Western Boulevard and other locations, and determine are you comfortable with open chain link or do you want more? I mean, that really, that really is the question that the planning advisory board and the staff spent probably, what, an hour? Yeah, it was, it was a, a good discussion. Long meeting with a lot of discussion. Good discussion. Mm -hmm. But what we would like is we're going to send out, uh, I haven't talked to Ryan about this, but maybe what we can do is this. Uh, later this week, we're going to send out a little survey to you. And we're going to give you some locations to go look at. And based upon the survey, that's what, and when I say the survey, we're just surveying <laughs> you as the elected officials. And then we're going to tailor the ordinance that will come to you based upon the input that you are giving. Now, if we need to go back and re-advertise, we'll do that. Because this is not something that has to be answered by the whatever the next meeting is, the 19th of February. But we'll work with the city attorney to make sure we're doing it according to the process. But we really need direction from you as to what you want your community to look like. This is one of those issues. Ryan, you said you had a lot of inquiries or concerns about this situation. Was it from people wanting to build new uh, contractor offices or was it more from the existing people? Uh, it was... You know what? Sorry. Where did it come from? Where did it... We've had multiple contractors that have been looking at other buildings to, to basically take down and, and occupy. Okay. And we've had to tell them, sorry, the zoning doesn't allow it there, so they had to find another location. <coughs> or they could have applied for special use. Or they could have applied for special use. Correct. Sense. Correct. Yeah. So, talking about the fencing, so somebody like Garris Evans, they're in Corridor Commercial, I assume, over there. Mm -hmm. workshop and so you can look in the back of their thing but they're not a contractor's office right they're right? they're a retail, retail type. office but that's actually one of the areas that's zoned industrial that we might would bring to city council to say hey does this really need to be zoned industrial you know back when the railroad track went beside it it probably made a lot of sense that it was zoned industrial in today's climate i'm not sure that that's the best zoning district for that location Problem is, is, just like Dr. Woodruff stated earlier, we didn't want to make any changes to the zoning districts because when we do, that creates some concerns and we may create some non-conforming situations. So before we bring those, we have to look at, okay, what zone should it be and what type of impacts are we going to um, expect to occur? You know, I, I think another good example is if you come in off of Jacksonville Parkway and come in there behind Lowe's, mm -hmm. You know, see the same thing. Now, that's corridor commercial there, but that's why we need for you to go out and, and drive your community, tell us what your thoughts are. I would also say to you this, you know, from a, and Ryan and, and uh, Jeremy and Ron and I had a good discussion about this this morning. I don't know that, that we should be concerned about fencing. A fence by its very nature is neither you know, in most cases, I don't know that a screened fence with green slats is any more pretty, if I'm sure that's bad grammar, is any prettier 
than the chain link fence. I think the real question is, how do you make things look good for your community? And normally it isn't about, unless you can convince someone to build a beautiful brick wall or have brick pilasters with wrought iron, you know, a fence is a fence, it's a function, it's a security issue. I think the real question is, what is the level of landscaping that we should require around a fence so that it intercepts the eye? Now, I'm certainly not talking here about putting an eight foot hedge or, or you know, cypress trees, uh, you know, all the way down. We can't get ridiculous. But if you could take a chain link fence and simply put in uh, some reasonable trees every 25 or 30 feet, that intercepts the eye where you're looking at something positive instead of something negative. But those are the type of things we're asking you to go out and look and give us feedback as to how you want to regulate this. One other item that the planning board mentioned in two pictures, I'll show you this, to where they would have to have a screen wall for their storage area, but next door, the, the rental tool company has mm -hmm. chain link. And in the other example, um, the, the gas company next door has chain link. So that was some of the concern that the, the planning advisory board expressed as well. That, so we, we make them have a screen fence and yet next door they have a chain link, so. Same thing. You know, as, as you made a good point about the, the landscape, and this is certainly an attractive attractive site. Uh, I don't care where, where it's at in the city, it's, it's attractive, so. And, and that's, I think, part of the issue that staff had as well by telling so many people, sorry, you can't go there. <clears throat> you drive by these sites and they look like professional business offices. In essence, that's what they are. They just have a component at the rear in a lot of cases where they have a building for storage or they have a storage secure lay down yard for their equipment and, and materials. So we thought that there was enough inquiries that it was worthy of <coughs> creating a staff initiated text amendment to bring forward to the planning board and city council. Something else that was brought up to uh, chain link fences by and large survived the hurricane unless a, f a tree fell on it. You introduce some screening and now you've increased the wind resistance and, and I'm sure that that would cause some additional expense and damages just by having the screening. So good point then the other question is the vehicles you know being lower than your fence so if you go with a six foot fence i mean everything's going to be higher than that well we don't have i don't think you have that well did we have that did we leave the height at six foot for materials stored in there or do we do away with that i think the materials still would still have, have to be have to below the height fence. but the vehicle portion was yeah, i can tell you that's not going to work for most people that are using it for real storage because most vehicle commercials are going to be higher than six feet. I mean, well, and that's the planning. That advisor. picture is a great example. Well, there you got a, a commercial vehicle with a ladder on it. It's higher than six feet. So the, but the planning, okay. <clears throat> but the, the vehicle's okay. Oh, it is. Yes, yeah, the, yeah. the planning okay. advisory board modified that okay. to go with just materials <laughs> versus vehicles uh, and materials. Perfect. So that was one of the changes that they made. Um, we will send you this text yeah, we'll so that as you go out, out and we'll also send you some survey options. Yeah, one, one last <laughs> item. Um, <coughs> because of security concerns, and I think you can get opinions that will vary, but some folks will tell you they want that open because if somebody's in that fence messing with the equipment, They'd rather have the visibility for law enforcement purposes. And other folks would say, well, I would rather have it screened so you can't see what's in the fence. So that's a personal preference. So I think you could have an argument, depending on who you speak with, about one versus the other. So that's a struggle that we've kind of dealt with as well. So I appreciate your time, and, and we'll, mm -hmm. we'll send out those surveys for you and bring this forward to you. Like I said, nobody's requested this. This is just something that we wanted to bring forward. Good. All right. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Council. At our January meeting, we held, uh, with the City Council, we held an issue relative to demolition. 
And a request was made by Dr. Washington for us to bring back an overview of the process. So Gary and Lily have prepared, I think, some excellent presentations. So, Lily, please. Good evening, Mayor and Council. As Dr. Woodruff mentioned, we're here to provide you an overview of our code enforcement process. And we use that as a neighborhood preservation and revitalization tool. Just want to go back just for our viewing audience as a reminder back in 2014 during one of your uh, advisory board summits, this came up as an issue, something that our citizens wanted to see change was that we um, address older neighborhoods, improve older neighborhoods. And of course, code enforcement is a vital tool that we use to do that. Our department is structured in this way. We are a community engagement. We have our code enforcement division, community development, and Office of Livable Neighborhoods and Community Programs. And all of us work together to uh, carry out these initiatives. We also, on a broader scale, work collaborative, collaboratively with different departments. We work with code enforcement, community development, planning, public safety, streets, sanitation, transportation, recre recreation, parks, and engineering to carry out our various neighborhood revitalization strategies. And she left out the city attorney. And city attorney. <laughs> <laughs> And media, I always forget media too. They, they help us promote these things very well. And in that toolbox that we use to protect our neighborhoods, we have our housing rehabilitation program. We have our new housing construction program. As you know, we actually purchase dilapidated structures and demolish and rebuild. And then we have our down payment assistance program. We want to encourage home ownership. We know that's a, a, a resource for protecting neighborhoods. A home buyer education to help our clients know how to maintain their homes once they purchase and go through that process, and then code enforcement. This is our um, subject matter for tonight. Minimum housing is a tool that we use. Um, City Code Chapter 5 outlines the process and the general statutes that give us the authority to enforce these codes. Um, it's established our minimum standards of fitness for initial and continued occupancy of all buildings used for human habitation. And this is done to protect the health and safety and the welfare of our citizens. Some benefits of code enforcement. We see improved land values. We know what happens with land values when we don't proactively address code enforcement. We see improved safety. We see what happens when we have broken window syndromes and the criminal element takes over a neighborhood. We see an improved sense of community, our neighbors. It's one of the benefits of our Office of Labor, Livable Neighborhoods, bringing our citizens together. An improved public image. This is one that's huge. It supports the, uh, Dr. Woodrow's Clean and Green initiative. And improves the quality of life. As a neighbor, when you're living next door to one of our blighted properties, our code enforcement uh, situation affects your quality of life. And so it helps to improve that. And then it increases the likelihood of economic development. We see an interest in redevelopment when we go into a neighborhood and maybe do two or three houses, you see other problems that's been to come in. So that um, sense of works with our economic development initiative. We do this through various forms of property owner engagement. We want to do is educate our um, citizens on what the code says. Gary does that daily. We hear it daily. Uh, he does excellent. We do it too. We do it too. <laughs> Those of us who have an office outside Gary's office can appreciate the conversations that he has uh, educating our citizens on what our code is. <laughs> and we uh, work to encourage maintenance and repairs. We want to see things done before it gets to a situation where you have to see it as you did uh, a few weeks ago. And of course, demolition is a last resort. We want to protect our housing stock to the greatest extent um, feasible. Some of the challenges that we have that we encounter dealing with these um, minimum housing code issues, it's air property. There's nobody taking responsibility for it. Um, there could be a number of heirs. One is paying taxes, but they don't own it. So the property maintenance, maintenance is neglected. Just overall upkeep is, is maintain, not maintained. Of course, there are no wills, so it's just left to whoever decides they want to take responsibility for it. And then when we do have and can engage the, the um, property owners, it's challenging gaining consensus. There's, you know, this was my father, we, we grew here, the sentimental value, we want to leave it to our children, we have every intention of repairing it, you get all of those uh, sentimental things. But what ends up happening is ultimately it's an abandoned property and it's ne ne uh, neglected and it is creating slum and blight in our community. And then another, another challenge we find with um, getting properties demolished is their liens on the property, particularly when it's air property, because every 
judgment, bad credit issue gets thrown on that property if you're in any way associated with it and have an interest in the property. Mm. So then we can't get it done voluntarily. Here we are. Gary gets engaged with our code enforcement process, and we all we have we take complaints. We do that proactively and reactively. Um, we our goal is to respond to a code enforcement complaint within 48 to 78 hours. They do a very good job. It's usually 24. This is our uh, standard. We issue a notice of violation. If we find that a violation actually does exist, we give the property owner 10 to 30 days uh, to come in and have a hearing and discuss what the issues are and what their plans are for that property. After that um, meeting, we Gary issues his findings of facts in order. We can determine if a, we have to designate if a property is deteriorated, deteriorated or dilapidated, and that's the 50% of value rule. If it goes over 50% of value to make any of the repairs, it's dilapidated. At that point, we strongly encourage um, demolition. There are those that choose to reinvest and continue on the repairs. Code says that we have um, can give them not to exceed 90 days to come into compliance with the findings of fact and order. If they don't, then we have what's considered a failure to comply, and we have an in-rim remedy option that we use according to our code, and that's where it comes before you for action. But I will say, even though the code says they have 90 days, we work with our property owners. I mean, that is, that's obvious. There are many off-ramps off when they get into code enforcement. Um, of course, he can refer them to us for a residential rehabilitation program. We receive a lot of referrals for voluntary demolition. And so we, we give extensions that they're pulling permits and they're doing what they have to do. We really work to gain compliance so that we do not have to tear a building down. Um, once it goes to, to um, if they disagree with the finding of the fact order, they can appeal the decision of the inspector to the Zoning Board of Adjustment. They have 10 days to do that. And then once their, the decision is made through the Zoning Board and also through you, they have another op option to go take their appeal to Superior Court, and they have 30 days to do that from your decision, which is what happened in the, the last case that you heard on January 22nd. They have until February uh, 22nd to appeal, which they have actually decided to demolish on their own, so they pull permits. So again, various opportunities to, to um, exit from the process. Um, if um, they don't comply after your decision, rem, in rem action is taken, then we enforce, we place a placard on the building. If they go in it, it's a misdemeanor. We record the ordinate, ordinance that you adopted and we proceed with demolition and those costs are placed as a lien upon the property. This is a lengthy process. But we're proud to say, through our teamwork and our various efforts, we have, as you know, uh, demolished 110 structures voluntarily since 2010. And we have five in our pipeline now that we actually have owner's authorizations on and are going through various processes of uh, testing for asbestos and scheduling the demolition. So the work continues. We, we do more good, and we try to keep these things from you. But there are situations where it cannot no longer be tolerated. We'll, we'll work it up the chain. Here's one we worked on recently in Belfort Homes. We discovered a mobile home in a rear of a, a house that we didn't know was there. Um, so we removed that. We have this demolition that was um, 248 Belfort Road, another structure gone. And then this is 202 Marine Plaza. This is the one you voted on, and they are actually taking it down. So we are actually seeing progress, which is really ultimately what we want. Um, we would love to get this done early in the process, but if it takes um, council action to get it done, that's fine too. So it's coming now. <clears throat> and so other demolitions that we have in the pipeline, just you may be aware, 1633 Lejeune Boulevard, there's a uh, property in Georgetown Road that's coming down. Fire department will use that for training. We still engage our fire department to keep our costs down. There's another mobile home in um, Collins Heights that's coming down on Collins Street, and then one right here in um, Bayshore. 103 Westminster, Westminster Drive. And so that's our code enforcement process real quickly. I hope it didn't go too fast, but um, just want to reiterate, we take every step we can to try to encourage renovations and repair, even the voluntary demolition. Those are grants, I'll say that for our viewing audience. There's no cost to the property owner. They um, submit an application for that. Demolition doesn't cost them anything. 
um, it accomplishes our goals and it helps them financially. That's a lot of the problem. It costs money to demolish. So this this incentive has is, is been a wonderful uh, benefit for our citizens in helping to get the city cleaned up. <clears throat> Lily, do we, uh, how do we market that? Do we get that word out in a particular way? Because, I mean, that's really a good message to get out that th they can apply for that grant and not, not have to pay anything. Because most people understand that it takes, it's expensive to take the structure down. Mm -hmm. It's not cheap. So, I mean, that'd be something to think about is how can we get that word out? Yes. Um, I'm trying to think when the last time we did marketing, we had to do some marketing. We used to have a demolition um, brochure and we gave all those out, but I would just say what we do between police department, code enforcement, and us uh, staff driving around the city, we find them. I mean, we just, <laughs> hey, there's one, let's start a case. Um, you, you all can bring them to us, but we could definitely do a better job of marketing and getting it back on, on G10. And, and our website is there. I mean, it's just good to get Social out. Social media. If, you know, if some heirs have a home that know that need to be torn down and maybe understand that it won't cost them anything if they reach out. Yeah. Well, if you look at the number of uh, units that have been torn down, you should also think of the number of new units that are being built. Mm -hmm. I know Mr. Jackson will, will remember that uh, on Bell, on uh, Hargett, just as you're about to enter Bell Fork Homes, uh, the city tore down a house. Mm -hmm. Guess what? It's a brand new two-story house being constructed today. So not only did we clean up the neighborhood, we're helping build the tax base. Uh, what we do find, though, is that with all of the emphasis that we have placed on the demolition projects, that when code enforcement goes out, we offer the, we offer the stick and the carrot. Mm -hmm. Not the carrot and the stick, but the stick and the carrot. The stick is... Folks, this house has got to be brought up to code, and you have so many days to do it. But on the other hand, if you'll sign this form, <laughs> we'll be very happy to take it down free and not leave your property. We will work on doing a good job of marketing, but what you'll find is that uh, word of mouth, face to face, uh, you tear down one house and somebody in the neighborhood calls and says, uh, how did that happen? Can we do the same? <clears throat> also, don't through the CDBG funds, don't we have relocation assistance? We do not. Um, we do not um, trigger relocation because all of the properties are <coughs> vacant. We do, relocation is very expensive. Um, so we do not offer relocation. We don't tear down anything that- So for example, if there's an older couple that lives in a, in a home that's just through the storms and years and age, the home really needs to be torn down, particularly after this last storm. Mm -hmm. What do you do? Well, what that, can we do for some somebody like that? <laughs> for somebody like that, we have in the past done temporary relocation. Again, we may have to put them up in a hotel or some temporary housing for the length of construction, 90 days, 120 days, but they get to go back. If we were to totally displace them, we're looking at about a five-year commitment to making sure they're financially whole from what it costs to move. Imagine someone who doesn't have uh, a big mortgage, $100 a month, and now that house is gone and they have to go somewhere else. We pay the difference in what they were paying and what they have to pay. So that's why we don't encourage. Do you do that through community? We don't because of the budget restraints, but it's an eligible activity. Okay. <laughs> so we try to keep them in the house as much as possible through our rehab. And that's another reason to come in and talk with us before the house gets that bad, that it needs to be torn down. We really don't want them living in a house that is on the verge of condemnation. Thank you. I think you can uh, agree that the staff has done an excellent job over the last uh, many years of cleaning up the community. These two people are essential in, in doing that. We would also ask, though, that for the next two or three days, please do not call Gary, because the first 30 minutes is about the Patriots and the Red Sox and the World Series and the Super Bowl. But maybe by Monday he'll be ready for the City of Champions. Gary Perch, you're It's hard to be humble, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you very much for the presentation. Oh, really good and Josh. We appreciate the hour, and I know there are a lot of things on the workshop uh, this evening. We'll try to move uh, through.
leadership and training and diversity, the city personnel policy 4.02 sets forth the city's diversity and inclusion program. The key elements in there are covered by one and two. The policy is designed to foster, cultivate, preserve a culture of diversity. Diversity includes all of those things. Age, color, gender, ethnicity, you can read the rest. It's also intended to create a work environment where we value various talents. All of us have different skills. Doesn't matter whether you're a Red Sox fan or a Yankees fan, we do value your, your skills. When you look at the total workforce, and this includes whether they're full-time or part-time employees. Now, if they're in this number, they're not hired through the temp agency. But we have 587 people. You can see the breakout, Caucasian, 448, African-American, 94, Hispanic, Latino, 29. Then you can also see the numbers where it's less than 1%. Basically, 76% of our workforce are Caucasian. 17% are African-American, 5% are Hispanic, and then less than 1%, another category. When you look at the city workforce versus the census for the county and the census for the city, we pretty much track in line with the census. That doesn't mean that we're where we should be. These are just numbers, but it gives you a frame of reference. <coughs> When you look for male and female, you see that we are 424 male, 163 female. That's really not that surprising because remember what we do. We pick up garbage, we repair streets, we do water and sewer lines, we do water plant. Interestingly enough though, we have found that in the last year or two, more and more females are working in some of these, what I'll call, traditional male construction type categories. Recently, we had a vacancy come where we had a male supervisor retire in public works, and the young lady or the person that was, was promoted, selected and promoted, was a female supervisor. And she's got great skills. So a change doesn't <coughs> occur overnight. It's, it's a gradual process. When you look again at the workforce, male to female, you can see that, yes, we are heavily dominated <coughs> by male workers compared to the county and to the city census. 72% are male in the city workforce, while the county population is 54% male and 59% in the city. I will say to you, Part of that is because, remember, the Marines are counted in the census. So that's what really kind of skews that number. When you look at the upper management of the city, there are 19 positions. 17 are Caucasian, 2 are African American, 14 are male, 5 are female. I would also remind us that moving these numbers is going to be very slow. Why? You only move them if a position comes open. I mean, there'll come a time when some of the department heads, including the manager's office, will come open. But you can't make change when they're full. Because like I've said to you and others before, you know, uh, unless y'all are going to expand the workforce, which I don't think you're going to do, or unless somebody retires, or unless somebody gets fired or somebody takes a job someplace else, these are numbers that are pretty static. It doesn't mean good or bad. It just means unless an opportunity comes along, this is what your upper management looks like. It's also true with the deputy directors and division directors. You can see, obviously, Caucasians, 20 out of 23. Neither good nor bad, it's just a statistic. Supervisors, heavily Caucasian, heavily male. Crew leaders are beginning to change the other way. 
not necessarily male to female, but African American to Caucasian. Why is this happening? For the last several years, we have been working on a leadership development program to train people and prepare them to move up in the organization. If you don't prepare people for an opportunity, then how are they going to successfully compete when the opportunity comes up? Vince Lombardi once said that the success of the Packers was not based upon luck. It was where preparation met opportunity. Now, I know today he would prefer to be the coach of the New England Patriots, mm -hmm. but that opportunity is apparently not there, right, Gary? Not for a while. Not for a while. <laughs> <laughs> but the point being, the city as a management team is putting our effort into preparing people for the future. When you look at the promotional uh, demographics, we've had 23 promo uh, 25 promotions in 2018. Six of those were African Americans, 24%. The leadership development program, which we put together, the purpose, prepare current employees for leadership with the city or others. Let's talk about that a second. Not everyone who is with the city is going to continue up the chain of management with the city. There are people sitting in this room who will move up the chain with the city. Or there are people sitting in this room who have developed the ability to take higher leadership positions with other cities. And when that happens, we're always proud of them. Because what that tells us is we've done a good job of helping them become a better professional, a better management person. In our leadership development, we've had 32 employees involved in two classes. 25 were Caucasian, six were African Americans, one other. We've had 19 promotions. Let me read to you a couple of statistics, though, that I find interesting. Out of the 25 Caucasians, 15 of them were promoted. Out of the six African Americans, four of them have been promoted. Again, these are just numbers, but what they show you is we are trying every day to work for more diversity and more inclusion. Are we where we need to be? Some people's eyes would say yes, some people's eyes would say no. The important thing is we're committed to preparing our employees, regardless of race, regardless of male or female, we're committed to working to develop the skills of our employees. And I think that's exactly what your diversity program and policy ask us to do. <clears throat> we are going to keep you posted on our constant progress. No one is satisfied with an organization that isn't serious about diversity and inclusion. As a country, we need to focus on making sure that everybody is included. <coughs> and that we don't have built-in barriers that prevent people with this organization from moving forward. That's why we continue to work on our internal leadership development. We do have a strong emphasis on promotion from within, but I'll also tell you we have worked to change some of the ways that we recruit people, and I'll be very straightforward and, and give you an example. The fire department, a wonderful asset to the city. If you look three or four years ago at the profile in the fire department, it was for all practical purposes, all white and almost all male, and a few exceptions. One was William Lee. William retired this past week. Really hate to see that. Great battalion chief, did a super job for us. But William's now retired. The only way that you're going to have competition from within by diverse ethnic groups is if you get them in from the beginning. So we looked at where the fire department was recruiting from. Anybody like to guess where the fire department recruits from? Volunteer fire departments. Volunteer fire departments. And if you look at the profile of volunteer fire departments, 
it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty, more, I mean, we have a lot of great volunteer fire departments. I'm just going to end it at that comment. What I was proud of, though, two weeks ago, we swore in eight new firefighters. Three of them were women, and three, or was it four? Three were, three, three were African Americans. Why? Because Mike Inera and Jerry Hardison are committed to having more diversity in public safety. We're going to get there one step at a time. But I guess a good way to say it is, you don't run a marathon in one minute. You run a marathon one minute at a time until you finally get home. And our pledge to you as the management is, we're going to continue to be focused on this. We're going to continue to set this as a priority to make sure we have as much diversity as we can possibly have. So that's my pledge to you as a council. Any questions or comments about where we are? I got there. one question for you. Um, the leadership development program, that's strictly voluntary? No. 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 Explain, uh, explain what, that to okay. us a little bit. And I'll be quite frank with you. What I do, since you know, I, I am responsible for the, the team here, we go out and we discuss with supervisors and with department directors, their staff. And we say, tell me who in your organization is an up-and-comer. The reason why volunteer doesn't work, in my opinion, is some people uh, are hesitant because they, uh, they just don't feel like they're going to stand a chance. So they're not going to take the effort. But if you reach to that person and you say, you are now going to attend these classes, it's a requirement. It's part of your job. You are going to attend the classes. I don't know whether you... What's Corey's last name? <coughs> Wally Humphrey. Humphrey. Corey Humphrey? <coughs> Tory. Tory. What's Tory's last name? Miller. Miller. Tory Miller. Young man in the streets department. <coughs> Four years ago, he had no idea that he would ever become a supervisor. He went through the training class. He competed successfully what, last, in January, Wally? Yes. And he was selected out of a field of three or four other people because of his skills and what he had learned in the leadership development program. So we don't ask for volunteers. We go out and get information, and then we say to these folks, you, we believe, have development potential. You will attend these classes. Now, at that point, we have given the person the opportunity. It's up to them when a vacancy comes up to decide they're going to apply. Because then they have to compete on their own merit. But Tori is a great example. And at probably age, what, 32? Let's just say, I have no idea. I'm just going to say he's a young man. He's going to be a supervisor with us for the next 20 years. <clears throat> Let's talk about some uh, indigestion. Okay. <laughs> budget updates, wage adjustment study, and budget challenges. As you'll recall, in the FY19 budget, we approved a step plan for the police department, and Mike Canera is going to be bringing you a report that shows how successful that has been. I think you'll be very pleased. It has definitely cause turnover to really cease. You also put in $300,000 for wage adjustment study. And what I want to do is take a minute to review with you where we are. The purpose was to study the city's pay plan, address inequities, turnover, and competitive pay. The general approach was to look at the data. We have 561 full-time equivalents at the time the study was done. These numbers fluctuate a little bit. Five part-time benefited, 79 part-time non-benefited. You have 35 pay grades. So what that says is that out of your 561 employees, everybody falls into one of those pay grades. A pay grade may have multiple <coughs> job titles in it. And I'm not, uh, I'm not sure. I'm just going to make something up here. The director of, well, let's, uh, let's use Lily. Lily is the director of community engagement. 
Ryan is the Director of Planning and Inspections. Wally is the Director of Public Works. Anthony is Director of Transportation. All of those job titles may fall in the same pay grade. So you see, while you have 35 pay grades, you have 202 job titles. Okay. So far, we've analyzed 108. We have 14 that is pending. That means we've been working with the department head, with uh, HR, to really look at the job description and what people do. And we have about 80 job titles that still have to be done. So far, out of the 202 job titles that have been analyzed, uh, there are, I'm sorry, out of the 108 that have been analyzed, we believe that there are 104 employees that should receive a compensation change. Now, they haven't received it yet because we said to you we would bring back a report before we spent the 300000 Here are the departments that are completed. And in uh, recognition of time, you can look at that. Here are the departments that are pending. Here are the departments still to be reviewed. So there's a lot of work still to go on. That's pretty much, you know, where we are in the uh, status report on the wage adjustment. We've not spent any of the 300000 Before we spend it, it will come back to you. But you can basically see that out of the, uh, let's see, okay, that's the ones that are completed, uh, 222 employees, pending another 104, so you're up now like 300 and something, and you have roughly 234. Uh, I will tell you, if you look at some of these, uh, you know, such as recreation or public services general, still a lot of work to do, but we've come a long way. Any questions on where we are on this? Not asking you to do anything, just giving you an update. Let's talk about the budget. Last week, we informed you of changes to the North Carolina retirement system contribution. We also know that we're going to have health plan funding issues, wage adjustment, and wage adjustment includes a potential step plan for fire and emergency services. I remember Mr. Bittner made the comment that when we adopted the step plan for the police department, it wouldn't surprise him if we also came back with a step plan for fire and emergency services. So we have been working on that. And then, of course, wage adjustments for others. Tax base and storm impact. Well, guess what? Every one of us who has property received a notice from uh, Mr. Smith saying, if you had damage or if you've built Please fill out this form. There, there will be a change to our tax base. Now, normally we think of the change to tax base because something got built or we had revaluation. We got a third, a third issue this year, and that is storm damage. I look around the room. I can point out at least one person who I won't necessarily point out, but he is sitting right next to uh, our best NC State fan who had major damage to his house. Will his <coughs> tax bill reflect the same this coming year as this past year? Probably not. Who knows? Sales tax distribution. We normally think of sales tax distribution as uh, the formulas. But I'll also remind you, last year the city did not increase our tax rate. That was great. Who did increase their tax base, their tax rate? And guess what? The tax rate, if you go up in your tax rate, you can actually be rewarded by getting more of the sales tax. Now, I don't understand the logic of that. When, the, when <coughs> one governmental agency, and this isn't a negative comment about people raising taxes, but when we don't raise taxes and we get penalized because somebody else did raise taxes, I'm just saying. Okay. <laughs> Uh, 800 megahertz, 800 megahertz project. Others, CIP. What about the 800? Thank you for that introduction. Let's look at the next series of slides. New financial software in the future. These are things that, that we're going to be facing in the next three to five years. 
Our financial software package is old. It works great. Only one problem. We've been notified that the maintenance is no longer going to be there. We're going to be forced to go. That alone, you're looking at over $3 million. Additional retirement cost, fire training grounds, recreation space. I mean, these are things that we are going to be facing, not in the <coughs> FY20 budget on this page. Let's get specific about the FY20 budget. The retirement board has mandatory contributions. Currently, we put in the FY19 budget a little over $2 million for the employee's retirement. This is just the city's contribution. Currently, 7.75, 8.5. Note, there's a minor adjustment there. Let's look at what's getting ready to happen. Because of the vote by the retirement board, which, by the way, you don't have any control over, you just have to do. In the FY20 budget, it's going to go from 7.75 to 8.95, which means we will have to come up with $300,000 more. So we will move from 2,089,000 to 2,400,000. And the next year, it goes up another 300,000. And the next year, it goes up another 300,000. And by 23, it will at least drop off a little bit. So what we're facing <coughs> just on retirement alone for the coming budget is almost the equivalent of one cent of tax not because of anything we did or didn't do. But once again, you know, these are, this is just the cost of doing business. And so, this is assuming a static wage. And that's <coughs> a very good point. This assumes a static wage. Let's say you pass along a 2% cost of living any of those years. These numbers ratchet up. But at the minimum, well, as Gail and the, and, and the and CMO work on your budget, we are having to put in 300000 more. Health insurance. We can tell you, uh, we're, we're right up against the line. Right now, it wouldn't surprise me if we come back and say we're looking at a minimum of 5%. City's contribution of 5%, $165,000. Not a lot of money, but when you add layer and layer and layer, $300,000 plus $165,000, you're now almost at half a million dollars, just those two issues. Tax base adjustment. Hurricane Florence damage, we mentioned that a while ago. <coughs> we have new value coming on because we've had some construction. We're going to have a lot of appeals. I don't think anybody's appealing who wants their value to go up. I think most of the appeals this year are going to be storm related. So our best guess right now is if we're going to be lucky, if the negatives because of storm damage simply balance, let me say it the other way. We're going to be lucky if the new caused by new construction equals the negative because of the storm. So we're assuming that for property taxes, no growth. We hope that that's the good position and not negative. Current year, roughly 23.7 million of your general fund budget, or roughly 47 million, comes from property taxes. The four cent fund. Uh, here are some things that we have placed on hold, and I was pointed out today that fiber optics, that money has actually been spent. But we know that Barn Street, one of these days we'd like to have that, that project's been placed on hold. Several reasons. Number one, we have no clue. You saw the report that I sent out to you last week about uh, uh, Jack M. Yet. For the public that didn't see it, to repair Jack M. Yet is currently estimated to be one and a quarter million dollars. How much of that will come from insurance or how much of it will come from FEMA? Still to be determined. What we do know though is this, we're going to bring you back an analysis that really says 
what do you really want to do? That's a small gym. Do you really want to go with something that's outdated just by putting a new roof and putting a new electrical system on it? Or do you want to do something bigger that really helps with some of the spatial issues with recreation? Wage adjustments. Currently, the consumer price index is somewhere around two. And again, whatever, you know, you're not obligated to pass on any pay increase for the employees. But you can see there is a cost. And those costs get layered on to the other costs that we're experiencing. Talk about 800 megahertz. When the county financed 800 megahertz, they didn't get into principal payments for a number of years. They front loaded interest, back loaded principal payments. Well, happy news. FY20 has come. $600,000 is going to have to be found to pay our principal and interest. Uh, are the county commissioners facing the same same thing? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, well, it's just this is thirty percent of that fund or that borrowing, or thirty percent. Yeah. So if you figure the other seventy percent, just double the fact. I mean, they're going to have to find over a million dollars. And again, software replacement and other things. Uh, here's kind of a scorecard, and it doesn't have a lot of the blanks filled in. As we work on your budget, retirement contributions, mandatory. Health fund, we're gonna have to do something. 800 megahertz, mandatory. So as we face the budget, we're automatically looking at a million dollars more in your general fund budget. A million dollars more. Now, some of the health fund actually comes from some of the other funds, so that's not a pure number. <coughs> However you want to add the numbers, what we're saying to you is we understand our role is to bring you a balanced budget. That's what our responsibility is. But we want you to see the challenges that we're going to be facing, and they're not self-inflicted challenges. And besides that, I really don't have any other good news. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions about tonight's meeting? If none, I'd entertain a motion to adjourn.